Good morning. I am Councilmember Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology. I want to welcome you all to our hearing. We are pleased to be joined today by the Committee on Small Business, chaired by uh, the gentleman to my right, Councilmember Mark Joni. Uh, today we will focus on the expansion of the film industries and how it affects New York City's communities, residents, and economy. Uh, the hearing will also focus on the following six bills. Intro 158, sponsored by Councilmember 11, would update the fees on filming permits on city property. Introduction 937, sponsored by Councilmember Eugene, would require film companies to provide residents with at least 72 hours notice when film shoots will disrupt parking in the area. Introduction 1495, sponsored by Councilmember Barron, would create a local community and media bill of rights addressing the issues that communities face during film and television production. Uh, intro 1515, also sponsored by Councilmember Barron, would create a task force to produce an action plan on film and television production to improve the economic impact on local communities uh, in New York City. And intro 1700, of which I'm a sponsor, would establish a 14-day notification requirement for movie making, telecasting, and photography permit applications when special parking requests are required. And finally, we will hear testimony on intro 1722, also sponsored by myself, which would require that certain applicants for film and television production permits pay a fee of $800 to cover the city's cost of providing such permits and would provide that these permits would expire 30 days after the date they are issued. New York City has experienced both positive and negative impacts from the film industry. Positive has been certainly job creation, tax revenue, um, and, but the negative uh, disruption of operations, uh, uh, complaints from residents and small businesses, uh, which includes, but not limited to, parking, noise, congestion, and lack of notice. With the film industry's continued growth, we hope to work together with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment to see more done by the agencies in mitigating any negative impact on our communities. We also look forward to hearing valuable testimonies from the administration, industry experts, community boards, civic associations, residents, businesses, and others. The testimony today is crucial uh, for understanding and, uh, the present problems and for building better solutions for our constituents. Um, and I'd like to recognize joining us is Councilmember Chin from Manhattan, and um, to my right, obviously, I mentioned uh, Mark Jonai, Councilman Jonai. I would like to acknowledge the staff uh, of the, the Committee on Technology, my counsel, Irene Bohofsky, policy analyst Charles Kim, financial, uh, finance analyst Sebastian Baki, uh, uh, and former policy analyst Patrick Mulvihill. I also would like to thank my own staff, Daniel Cozina, and Communications Director Ryan Kelly for the valuable assistance in, pre in preparation for today's hearing. I will now turn it over to my co-chair of the committee today, Mark Jonai. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. I'm Councilman Mark Jonai, Chair of the Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our joint hearing with the Committee on Technology, chaired by my good friend, Councilmember Robert Holden. Our hearing today focuses on the film industry expansion and its impact on New York City economy, city residents, and our small businesses. New York City is one of the most sought after cities for film schools in the world. From our city's iconic skyline to our diverse, diversity of locations, New York City is an attractive location for film and television shoots. Since the early 2000s, the film and television industries have expanded in the city. The rise in popularity of streaming services like Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu has further increased the demand for new content and stimulated a large surge in television productions in New York City. The expansion of the film industry has certainly had positive impacts on the New York City economy. Film productions helped contribute over $12 billion to the city in 2018. The film industry has also provided new employment opportunities for city residents. To the associates, representatives, and members of the film industry that are here today, I thank you for choosing New York City. 
I, feel, I hope you have had the opportunity to enjoy our lively city and vibrant culture and contribute to our local economy. Mom and pop shops are obviously at the center of what makes New York City great. While I welcome the expansion of the film industry, I want to make sure small businesses are benefiting from the expansion too. Our small businesses operate in an increasingly harsh environment from the rise of e-commerce to big box store competition, consumer behavior changes, or government regulations, our small businesses are facing more and more hurdles. The expansion of the film industry should not be another obstacle that mom and pop shops have to worry about. Small businesses rely on foot traffic. Blocking a small business's visibility or closing down a street can be a massive hindrance to their daily small business operations. Similarly, small businesses are not being given proper notice of when filming will be occurring in their neighborhoods. The administration must do a better job at notifying small businesses and communities of when filmmaking will occur on their streets. Small businesses rely on deliveries to their stores, and mom and pop restaurants depend on their customers being able to park near their store to grab a quick slice sandwich or food of their choice. The administration's closing down of streets and the lack of warning given to small businesses makes it harder for small businesses to keep their doors open. That includes things like preparing for a reduction in foot traffic by scheduling fewer staff. To arranging commercial deliveries, without enough notice, businesses may be overscheduling staff or preparing to receive deliveries that may not be able to get down the block at all. Some neighborhoods of the city are used more frequently for film schools. These hotspot areas may experience greater disruptions, with some areas receiving permits almost every other day. In one such instance, West 48th Street and 6th Avenue Manhattan was granted almost 200 permits in 2018. That's almost two-thirds of the entire year. No city resident should feel that they are living in the parking lot of a Hollywood film shoot. While some areas of the city may not be more desirable than others for production, inundated neighborhood with shoots can hurt the quality of life for city residents and our small businesses. We need to develop a more fairer system in issuing permits to provide businesses and residents the relief from the constant noise and disruption from film shoots. Although many productions play by the rules, not all do. It is essential that we value and are clear about the recourse communities have when they feel film shoots go too far. The administration needs to value resident and small business voices and communicate better between all parties. Residents and small businesses need to know what to expect from film shoots, what impacts may be anticipated, and what is improper behavior. Finally, I implore film productions to, st to shop locally. Our small businesses are an essential aspect of the New York City culture and economy. Allow them to benefit from your expansion, and small businesses in the film industry can thrive together. Before concluding, I'd like to recognize my fellow council members, Council Member Chin, and my colleague Holden for the work that was put into this hearing and the concerns. I will turn it over to Council Member Barron. Oh, she's not here. Um, I do want to recognize the hard work that the City Council staff has put into this in working with the administration and industry and stakeholders, uh, from Irene to Stephanie and including my staff. I want to thank them all for their commitment and dedication. I pass it on to you, Chair Holden. Thank you, Council Member Jonah. We are joined by Council Member Ayala. Just walked in. Thank you. And uh, Council will now swear in the first panel. Good morning. Do you affirm to tell the truth and answer honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Thank you. 
It's not on. Shall I start again? Okay, my apologies. Uh, yeah, I do, I do work in media. I should know that that goes on. Um, <laughs> good morning, Chair Holden, Chair Joni, and members of the City Council Committees on Technology and Small Business. My name is Anne Del Castillo, and I'm the Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. I'm joined here at the table by my colleague, Dean McCann, who is MOM's Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Film, Theater, and Broadcasting, and Lori Barrett-Peterson, our General Counsel, as well as my senior leadership team seated to the right of me. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here to discuss the impact of the expansion of film and television production in New York City. Before I had the privilege of being MOM Commissioner, I had the privilege of being born a New Yorker. And over the years, I have witnessed firsthand the changing landscape of our city and the growth of film and television production in particular. So I do get it. Film and television productions can be disruptive to New Yorkers, including local businesses. In fact, once when I was moving, a film crew made me park my truck around the corner from where I was moving into, and believe me, I got some exercise that day. But that is not the entire story. Film and television production is a New York success story. It is a story born of more than half a century of strategic thinking, collaboration, and engagement among city agencies, communities, industry, and other stakeholders, and of course, with the advice and input of city council. Think of what we've done together. New York City was the first in the country to establish a cultural affairs commission and a film commission. We made strategic investments to draw businesses and jobs to increase opportunities for New Yorkers in the creative economy. Through our collective efforts, we now have a thriving creative economy and good paying jobs, expansion of other, other tech and innovation industries, increased tourism, and a global reputation as a world-class center for creativity and culture. When governments from other municipalities, states, and countries want to see how this is done, they look to New York City. So I sit here before you filled with pride and gratitude in our shared success. Of course, growth comes with challenges, especially in a city of 8.6 million people that runs 24-7. At MOM, we are acutely aware of the inconveniences New Yorkers and local businesses face when the film and television production industry comes to their neighborhoods. But when we look at those challenges, we must also consider what the term production industry actually means. The first thought that comes to mind is the big studios, but New York City's production industry is also comprised of 130,000 New Yorkers. They're freelancers, artists, artisans, union members, and small business owners. They are our family, our neighbors, our friends, and they are all New Yorkers who are earning a living in their city. Each year, in the course of doing their jobs, this industry spends almost $9 billion right here in New York City. So they aren't just helping themselves. They are contributing to our shared success. MOM is here to ensure that New Yorkers can continue to have these opportunities in film production and at the same time cause minimum disruption to neighborhood residents and small businesses. MOM engages in a collaborative, flexible, and responsive approach with communities, productions, and our sister agencies to anticipate and mitigate problems before they arise. By the time a crew lands a production in a given area, MOM has already limited that production's schedule, size, and location according to the specific needs and characteristics of that particular community and surrounding neighborhoods. Because every community, every street, and every production is different. Last year, we issued more than 14,500 permits. By contrast, the number of inquiries we received from the public amounted to less than 10% of that number. Nevertheless, there is always room for improvement. That is why, in my first five months of office, I have made it a priority to meet individually with each of the members of the Council. I have met with about a third of you so far, and these conversations have been critical to understanding the ebb and flow of your respective districts and what other projects are occurring, whether public works, transit, block parties, or other street activities, and how we can work together more effectively to offset the impact of production in particular. These conversations have set the foundation for collaborative solution seeking as issues arise. For example, there was an instance recently where a production landed in a neighborhood and residents expressed concerns about parking. The council member in that district reached out to my office, actually me directly, and we were able to identify a mutually agreeable solution for production parking for the remaining days of that production. 
In addition to troubleshooting, these conversations also help inform our office about local resources for productions. There are countless churches, schools, parks, and nonprofit organizations throughout the city that have hosted productions and benefited from location fees and community givebacks. Materials for the Arts is an example of an organization that has received countless donations from the sets that are built and recycled materials to the benefit of nonprofit organizations throughout the city. The Parks Department also reported that it received more than $360,000 donations, $60, in donations from productions. Productions participating in the Made in New York marketing credit program, which only captures a, fra captures a fraction of the films made here, contributed more than 170,000 to cultural organizations across the five boroughs last year alone. The increase in production activity has also resulted in increased demand for local talent. To that end, the Made in New York production assistant training program was established to pr provide free training for underemployed and unemployed New Yorkers seeking work in production. Over the last 10 plus years, more than 800 people have graduated from the program and secured jobs in the industry. That program also served as a model for the more recent Made in New York post-production training program, which has graduated dozens of New Yorkers in the fields of editing, animation, motion graphics, and visual effects. Graduates from these programs are now working in production and are also hiring their successor graduates from these programs. These programs were developed in consultation with employers to ensure that the participants gained relevant skills so that we can build a strong pipeline of New York City talent to continue to build our local industry. Overall, MOM has created educational and training programs that reach 6,000 New Yorkers a year. The benefits of our thriving film and television production sector ripple out far beyond the boundaries of any given location shoot. Film and television production creates jobs and opportunities for New Yorkers who have never set foot on a set. We hear many stories from local business owners who tell us how business generated by productions has helped them grow and thrive. I'd actually like to, you to hear just two of these stories um, from local entrepreneurs themselves. We ha just have two very short videos, I promise, to play. So if we can pull those up. Do we have those? When I started Melba's Restaurant and Catering here in Harlem, I was really thinking about my grandma Amelia. She taught me the best way to take care of people was through food. Now, I take care of the film industry week in and week out. They know what they want and it's got to be good. Production catering is a big part of our business, and that means more chefs, more servers, more jobs in the neighborhood. My business works in New York because the film business works for New York. My family and I started this business 25 years ago in the Manhattan flower market. Since working with film and television, we've grown our business and become a daily destination for set designers. I'm a florist and I work with set decorators for TV and movies. I love working in New York because there's resources like this right around the corner. I'm always running in and out of here every day. I think the best ideas come out of New York and we're proud to be in that mix. My business works in New York because the film business works for New York. These success stories are possible because of the drive, talent, and hard work of small business owners themselves, film productions that spend money with them, and also the collaborative, responsive, and flexible approach that city government has taken with respect to production. We all should be proud of what we have achieved together. Decades ago, we were the first city in the nation to set up a governmental entity to make film and television production work for everyone. And look where we are now. 130,000 New Yorkers working in production that supports 300,000 other jobs in related industries outside production. Together, that's approximately 10% of New York City's total employment. The freelancers, union members, and small business owners, the artists who work in film and television production spend almost $9 billion a year directly in our city and generate $400 million in tax revenue. They create images of our city that are unforgettable. Each time someone somewhere sees an image of New York City on a computer, television, or at a movie theater, our position as a world capital grows. I look forward to working closely with the council and every community to ensure that this great city, this great New York City success story continues. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Lander and Councilmember Barron, and I understand Councilmember Barron would like to make a statement on her two bills. Uh, thank you to the chair and thank you to the panel. 
and thank you for the public for coming. This is a very important issue because New York City is seeing more and more instances of neighborhoods being bombarded with film crews coming in, taking up space, making their films, and uh, we want to make sure that the communities are being respected. So I propose two bills. One talks about establishing a bill of, uh, bill of rights for the communities, and we've met and we've talked about uh, the intent and the objective of that bill. And the other one talks about without trying to extort um, money from film companies, what can we expect film companies to do to make sure that there's some kind of reciprocity and benefit for the communities where they are, inconveniencing people who live there for whatever number of hours or days that they're there. So that's the intent of the two bills, and we want to look to see how we can shape that so that communities benefit from allowing themselves to be the site for these wonderful films that are being made in New York City. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we understand that um, the, film, uh, the film industry is very important in New York City and the productions, and we, we certainly understand that. However, when it's on the, when the, the, really, the people that pay the most for these film shoots, aside, we understand the billions it brings into the city. That's what we're told, and that's what we hear. Um, however, on the front lines, when productions take over an entire commercial district, it seems like this administration is willing to say, let these small businesses suffer. They're, gonna, they're going to um, put up with no parking in, their, in front of their stores for many times, several days, if not weeks. And nobody actually reaches out to them. You have a code of conduct on, in your uh, MOM, in the MOM uh, code of conduct I'm reading that the film companies or production companies are supposed to notify the community boards and the council members. I've never got a call from a production company in advance of shooting. I don't know if any council member here has gotten a call from a production company, but I never have. And we get the flash notice two days before, and then we get the frantic, when the, um, the signs go up in the neighborhood that there's going to be a film shoot and no parking for an extended period of time, the administration is essentially saying, fend for yourselves, find your own parking at your own expense. Same thing with the businesses. There's no outreach. We hope that changes under your, under your um, leadership. However, we haven't seen it. And the straw that broke the camel's back for, for me was a film shoot on my two commercial districts the week before Christmas. And Dozens of cones went out, and they actually a day before. The day before the permit, the film companies were brazen right before Christmas to take over the entire district and to put parking earlier than they're supposed to. So the oversight, I question the oversight from this administration. I, 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 I would hope that your office would have more people to, because to, um, we, we were checking with uh, your office uh, many times before, and, uh, your predecessor, and we didn't get answers. We got more cooperation from the, from the film production companies, to be honest. They actually worked with us if we reached out to them. But there's a host of other problems. The, the permits that are listed on the polls, they ask you to call a phone number. The number doesn't work many times. It'll just ring and ring and then hang up after 10 rings. Nobody's at, at, the, uh, at the phone. So I had so many businesses call me and say, we couldn't get our deliveries. How dare the city schedule a film shoot right before Christmas, the most lucrative time of the year for us. Many businesses were telling me they lost $15,000 at least in a couple of days of shooting. And again, this, the administration is willing to say, sorry, it's, it's a benefit of all New Yorkers that this happens, but you guys will have to take the uh, the hit. So that's why, I mean, your Kumbaya little video was fine, a commercial, but it wasn't really, it's not reality, because yes, you, got, you paid somebody to do that or you had somebody do it. That is not reality on, in the, on the front lines, at least in my district. Uh, and, I, and speaking to my fellow council members, that's the same you know, feeling. We understand 
the contributions to the city. However, we need more done. I don't know if your office can figure out something. I tried with legislation. We, we could reimburse the businesses if they lose parking or give them um, other um, avenues to, to recoup the money. But there has to be something figured out that you're just willing to say, sorry, this is going to happen in front of your uh, business, and you have nothing to say. You can reach out to a number that doesn't, nobody answers. You can call the council member, but we don't get the calls from the production companies. They don't notify the community boards. They don't not notify the bids or the LDCs. They don't. We've discovered, we asked if, if any of them have received calls. So if they're not, if the production companies are historically are not going to follow your code of conduct, then where are we? Then they, then they, they take more and more parking. So, yes, they do. Well, I've if, seen it. I want to show some photographs. If I may, Council yes. uh, Chair. Uh, you know, it's actually one of the reasons why I reached out to your office um, within my, for my, when I was even acting in February. I've literally spent the first five months of my tenure trying to meet with every single one of you. There are 51 districts throughout the city, and we know that there are issues. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that, you know, there, there aren't improvements that we need to make. Um, I actually have worked in the industry for a greater portion of my career, and I, and I understand how these things can land. I also care a lot about the city. We really are focused on making sure that we can play well in the sandbox together. And so that is why I've taken, uh, I've dedicated this first five months to meeting with you, as well as the productions, to say, hey, we need to be doing better. We absolutely need you to be doing better outreach to the council districts and the communities where you're filming. That said, I, I do think it's important to draw a distinction. There are situations where there are small films, and they're just going to land for a day, whereas there, and then there are larger films that may um, land for a more significant amount of time. Those are the ones that we're focused on. Those are the ones where we're working, making a concerted effort to work with them, to reach out to you and the community boards before they land. I definitely know we can do better, and I do remember that incident, and that was what predicated the, um, the meeting with you. And, uh, so we really are working hard to make sure that we are doing outreach and really looking to you to help us understand the ebb and flow of your respective communities. You know, when I say there are 51 council districts, I say that to point out that there's such a diversity of neighborhoods. And so what may work in your council district may not work in another one. And in order to better understand how that works for the city so that we can land productions well in neighborhoods and work well with the community, I need to have this open dialogue with you. And I, I think we're off to a good start. Um, I, you know, I've met with, a, with about a third of you so far, and that is just one part of a multi-approach strategy that we're taking to do better with working with production and the local communities. Um, you, you see a photo up now of, um, this is a, a catering truck in front of a diner. Now that's against your code of conduct. Who's enforcing it? So if your office is going to be reactive, that means somebody has to complain, but nobody goes out apparently, because I don't think you have enough staff, to actually go out and check uh, or visit each site. I understand that. However, we need someone, mm -hmm. and whether it's the production companies themselves going around saying, you know, somebody is in charge of this, saying, we can't do this. Absolutely. Uh, we can't block uh, a fire hydrant. I saw cables, I don't know if we have that photo, um, of very, no, with no trip hazard, it was, it was a trip hazard, no covering on cables going across a bus stop. So people can get off a bus and trip over these mm -hmm. huge ca cables um, on, on the commercial strip. There's so many violations, and this is what happens when there's lack of oversight. So that's why, that's what we're providing here, because we pointed out, and when I spoke to the previous commissioner and went, mentioned this production company, um, and I'll tell you the, the company that was shooting, the, it was billions that were shooting on my commercial district uh, right before Christmas, viol violated almost every uh, part of, or every, um, issue numbers of the code of conduct, every single one. And we said, what is going on? And again, I got, oh, this is a $9.8 billion industry and you're benefiting and you're, you're a taxpayer. Nobody wants to hear that when we have specific problems that we're bringing to the, to the, to Moam. And we never got them addressed, by the way. 
Hmm. The production companies, and we still, we're still not getting them addressed. They're still violating codes of conduct. Why have it if you're not going to enforce it? And nobody is, is looking at this. So it's not up to us. We have many things to do in the office, um, in our council offices, but dealing with every production, which is happening every week, we get a two-day notice, mm -hmm. and then we get the calls from residents who can't find parking, because for two days, and businesses that can't get deliveries, and nobody's reaching out to them. And that's what has to change. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hope, under your leadership, Absolutely. that will change. Absolutely. I want to um, just recognize you. Um, yeah. You want to? Okay. Um, Councilman Yeager, Councilman Yeager is joining us. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you did a uh, stellar job of explaining some of the issues that our communities, residents, small businesses are facing. And Commissioner, I part the beginning of something is acknowledging there's a problem. And we hope that problem solution mm -hmm. is the next step or discussion. And I just want to put things into perspective using your own numbers. Um, last year you issued 14,500 mm -hmm. permits some large, some shorter time and duration. How many staffers do you have? Uh, we have about 20 staffers at the film office. I'm sorry? 20 staff at the film office. I didn't hear 20. That. 20. In the film office. I, you know, our, our agency covers uh, several portfolios, and, but in the Office of Film, Theater, and Broadcast in particular, we have 20. Of the 20, how many leave the office that have responsibilities of oversight? Four. Four. So let's do some math. And we'll five. use five, sorry, five. five. Yes. Okay. Yes. So of the 14,500 mm -hmm. permits, the year's 365 mm -hmm. days a year. We're assuming that they're doing this on weekends as well and night and 24 hours. We want to take into consideration the shifts that your employees have, mm -hmm. which will make the number a lot worse. But that would mean there's 40 permits that are issued today on average. 14,500 divide that by 365 of the 40 that are going on today as an average, that would mean you have five employees that there are eight sites throughout the city that each employee is responsible for oversight. Mm -hmm. Now, to I be clear, imagine. those 40 permits are not all large-scale productions. I mean, sometimes in the case of a student film shoot, it's a van that's parking. You may not even realize it's there. Um, so I just want to, I think it's important to draw that distinction. But I'm not going to sit here and pretend that, you know, the volume is not quite significant and we definitely need to do better about making sure that our team is getting out there. I think that's also why I'm saying it's important for us to get to know these communities better so that we can get ahead of some of the problems. Um, and then the communication with your office and the local communities is helpful in making sure that we're responding um, immediately to issues on the ground. So, Commissioner. Can you tell us where the 40 permits, and I'm assuming just average, that are, have been issued as of today, effective today, where they are in the city and what period of time they'll be doing their film shoots? Uh, n not right now. I mean, I could certainly get back to you with that information, but yes. I expect we'll be here for a while, so maybe you can help us understand. Maybe you can have someone look into it while we're continuing the hearing. That will give a real picture Mm -hmm. of what is happening in the daily lives of New Yorkers. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, one thing to add to what the commissioner said, in addition to our staff that go out and do site visits and check on, on those things, we also have an NYPD movie unit that's very well versed on what the rules are and a lot of the sets that we, you know, when we have uh, actors in police uniform walking down the street for Blue Buzz, we have a real officer there. So there are other sets that have either the supervisor. Sorry, you, you, you weren't sworn in. Can we swear him in? He was here. We did it? Yes. Okay, yes. I don't lie. No. <laughs> 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 But, you know, we have, we have sergeants that are on 24 hours. I, you know, communicate with the sergeants often. We have officers that are assigned specifically to the sets. We know which sets the officers are assigned to, so our field reps may prioritize and go to the sets where they're shooting interior. 
and then inspect how the truck package has landed and you know what what literally is on happening on the ground so we would prioritize with our staff which sets we know NYPD is not going to be assigned to in addition to checking on the sets that NYPD is assigned to we have people who check on things at night we have people who check on things very early in the morning you know we do everything that we can do to get to every single set um, so you know it's it's we'd love to have a hundred people out on the street every day inspecting sets but you know that's not the way the system was originally built we weren't budgeted for that but you know there's no doubt that we can get more bodies out there we just need to hire them and could I just to one point that you made in your in your statement the, the number of permits that were issued for 48th Street and 6th Avenue is because there's a film, a studio there. There's a show that broadcasts live from the studio every day. And every day they get permits because they're gonna have the florist, box truck pull up, drop off props, you know, set up trees and things. So that's why that number is so high. And they're only there for a couple of hours. It's like a pull up, offload, they shoot the live show on the plaza, and then they load everything back into the truck, and it's gone. But I, I just wanted to make that point. I, I want to thank you for that, um, Mr. McCain. Correct. Yes, sir. Help me. The idea is we are the, the idea is to have a complete understanding. And what you've just described now is you have NYPD, a specific unit that's responsible for oversight. No, they contribute, contribute. To, to our oversight. But, so yes. we have more bodies than just the four that are eyeballing what's happening on the sets. You also have to remember, we and know who the bad players are. You know, there are these, these shows, many of them are extremely conscientious. You have shows that know that they want to go back to the same location potentially a month later. Or you, they know that, you know, CBS might shoot on Monday and NBC is going to want to be there the following Tuesday and they don't want to ruin it for the other shows. So, you know, we know who the, the good players are, we know who the bad players are. And again, that's what we prioritize, you know. I want to, I appreciate your response. I just want to have a clear picture. So the NYPD assistance that you receive what is the phone number to that division? I could get you that phone number. I have it with you. I mean, I would imagine that you guys are the... I have the sergeant's cell phones because usually those, that's my first point of contact. I have the lieutenant's cell phone because I don't know always which officer is assigned to which shoot. They also have an office that's... Um, 24 hours theoretically where they you know the productions will request NYPD coverage that we collaborate with and then they have a 24-hour number that you know when a sergeant comes on duty at 10 o'clock he checks the voicemail at his office to see if there's any changes for production or if they received a call with a complaint so I mean I I have all the sergeant's cell phone numbers we could provide and we have actually in many occasions, there was a period of time we tried it, but um, we used to put the NYPD's phone number on the signage. And then we were told, take that off. And Why do you think that happened? Because they wanted everyone to call 311. Oh, yeah, perfect. It was, it, it was the innovation of 311, and they wanted um, citywide services calls to go to 311 so they could track it. So, how many calls did 311 receive last year? Specific complaints to movie shoots. Oh, gosh. We had less than, what was it, 900 calls to 311? I don't have the exact number, but it was. I think it was like 800. It was, it was, it was less than 900. Total for the year. Total for the year was what number? No, less than 900. Less than 900, so roughly three a day. Yes, but they're not all complaints. Some of them are also, you know, we're tracking by inquiries. We're not, like, that's the total number of inquiries. I received the 311 breakdown for my district, for example, and it's broken down by category. I've never seen a category that's specific to 
movie shoots. Right, that's what I'm saying. So that's just like the calls to our office. To your office at 311? Well, that get directed from 311 to our office. 311 do, do, doesn't really, I mean, if they, if they can answer the question, they answer the question, but 311 directly routes the caller to our office. And then, I've, I've made those calls. I've never been rerouted to anyone's office. They've taken the complaint as a noise complaint. No, we get, I get a lot of calls routed from 311. And then, you know, when our office, every, you know, all of our coordinators, we have seven permit coordinators, they're all assigned a specific job. So there's one person that does law and order. There's one person that does blue bloods. If we get a call regarding blue bloods, whether it's, you know, before they've landed or when they're on the ground, that call will be routed immediately to the production coordinator that supervises that show in our office, and they will call Blue Bloods immediately, speak to the production, and address the issue. Great. So let's stay on that for a moment. I call 311 now. How long before 311 contacts you to let you know there's a complaint? I was under the impression it's in real time. Mm -hmm. Are you open 24-7? Uh, no, but we're so, we're so who's answering that call tonight at midnight? Well, I checked the voicemail. I mean, you know, we stagger it a little bit. I, you know, I'll, I'll call the general a voicemail. Let's acknowledge the real problem. Let's acknowledge there's a concern here and a potential for a 311 call that's made that has a real impact on a business or a community or a resident that doesn't get acknowledged safely until after the shoot is done. You yourself acknowledge that right now there's there are movie shoots that are being done mm -hmm. that are short time in duration. They can be uh, out there for just a few hours. Mm -hmm. But that few hours, there'll be no one responding to an issue. It could be life-threatening, oh, it life -threatening, could be an inconvenience, or just, I'm sorry? If it's life-threatening, I would imagine it would get responded to. So I mean, that's the... That's the so the yeah. cables that were across a bus stop that my colleague just mentioned, how long do you think before someone could received that notification, and responded to it. So I can cite an example where we had another situation at 10 o'clock. I was out, um, and I got a call because there was a situation in a neighborhood, and there was a concern. So that call came directly to me. I then called Dean, and he called the local precinct, and we resolved the issue that night. So that's how quickly it can get resolved. I want to be a part of the solution, and I just, I don't want to villainize, make the industry a villain. Mm -hmm. That's not my intent. Mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge, and I was hoping that we would both acknowledge there's yes. real issues, and then say, what are we going to do mm -hmm. to correct these conditions? Right. That's the whole idea. Right. The and idea would be a 24-7 hotline mm -hmm. that live someone will answer, mm -hmm. that there would be a direct number that someone can call and expect an immediate response whether it be something as minor as perhaps they're blocking my driveway mm -hmm. to the lights are gleaming into my apartment and my newborn can't sleep right. to the noise that's impacting me where I'm not going to be able to get the rest that I need to go to work tomorrow to the I have a scheduled delivery coming in that cannot be stopped. I have a scheduled grand opening of my business that cannot be rescheduled that only happens once. Mm -hmm. That's the idea of these hearings, that we identify a, a problem and collectively come up with a solution. Yes. What commitment can we hear from this administration, from you in particular, that will alleviate at a minimum a person of contact 24-7 that will be responsible to receive the phone call and address the issue. Respectfully, I think what I'm trying to express to this committee here is that we are working to be responsive, and we have been responsive time and again when issues have come across our desk. And so, you know, part of this is the beginning of a conversation to really understand what some of the issues are and come up with solutions that are attainable and, uh, and feasible given the current structure of just not just our office, but the way that the city is working. There are many, many challenges with street activity in New York, uh, not just production. And so we are all trying to uh, work around those challenges. And again, I think that's why these conversations with 
uh, the local communities directly are critical to understanding how to prioritize some of the issues that are arising. Again, some of the, there are certain communities that may tend to be more impacted than others just due to the location of production activity, and so we want to address those. There are other communities that are asking for production that need support to understand how to land production in those communities. So, so that's, that's the broad, when you say that you want a complete picture, that is the complete picture. We are trying to be all places um, throughout the city to work with the local communities to best understand how to land production there. And then we're working with the productions of varying sizes, again, student films up through big blockbuster productions to make sure that we are managing that activity properly. I thank you for that, Commissioner. But I'm asking a specific question, and I'm hopeful that we can come up with, this is probably the most simplest of issues that we can address. A 24-7 live answer phone number. Wouldn't cost much. Sprint offers a $25 a month. Unlimited phone calls. Just need someone in our end to pick up. I want to make sure that whatever solutions we put in uh, will s truly address the issue. And in this case, you know, we have multiple productions. So even if we have one person answering that phone, we still have to reach the appropriate staff or the appropriate production. So I, I think, you know, at the moment, the way that it's working is they're coming to Dean or myself, and we know who's on the ground and which pr staffer is working on that production. And that has been the most efficient way to resolve the issues so Commissioner, I appreciate that, Commissioner. So then, based on what that statement that you just made, can I have a list of the 40 permits that on average are issued today that are going on in New York City? I'm hopeful that someone can pull that out of your office. I'd like to know how many officers are on those permitted sites and who is responsive. And we can do, and I can go as far as doing a quick test on any one of these sites now, and we can really have an understanding of the breakdown. I'm really trying to help shape this yes, direction sir. that we're going in and not yes, make it that much more difficult. Okay, we, so can we email? I'm this? sorry, will you excuse sorry. me? I'll call my office. That'd be great, okay. absolutely. Okay. So while you're looking into the 40 permits to find out how many officers have been assigned to those sites right now, and we're so quick to respond at the city council, hopefully there's one locally that a city council staff member can run out there now and see who's on site. We're good, but I pass it back to my colleague in the meantime. All right, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to have some more questions, but I want to just uh, get uh, some colleagues involved. My colleagues, uh, Council Member Chin has some questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. We still have not met. I know. <laughs> and I'm in my, my district, <laughs> lots of production going on every single day. <laughs> because we're the oldest part of Manhattan and everybody comes down there. I mean, I agree with you that the production, the film industry is making a lot of contribution to our city. Everybody loves to see their neighborhood in the movies. And, you know, we love the revenues that's generated. Uh, but we just want to make sure that our neighborhoods are not, you know, getting disturbed mm -hmm. constantly. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, Right here, not too far, on Reed Street, uh, between West Broadway and Church. Just in this year, film production was there three days in January, three days in February. Uh, they were there in March, they were there in May, and they're back again in September. And Reed Street is a very narrow street. And they also use that street as staging area. So a lot of family lives there, people, families with stroller, and it's just creating a havoc, and that's just one example. Mm -hmm. This goes on all over Chinatown, mm -hmm. Soho, Tribeca, Financial District. Yeah, we all love law and order, okay? <laughs> but like, come on, enough is enough. And I know that from your predecessor, we can ask for a moratorium, mm -hmm. right? So you could get a short break, and then they come back again. Mm -hmm. And some of my colleagues, you know, raise the issue about the disruption and, and all those wiring that you have to walk across, and it's dangerous. Because when I walk around my district, I have to be very, very careful. Just a couple of days ago, there was a film shoot going on on Center Street. They're using one of the old buildings, but they took up the whole block, you know, with their trailers and all the wiring all over. 
We have a lot of seniors in lower Manhattan, mm -hmm. and it's really dangerous. And so who is really doing the oversight? And that should not be my office. No. Because when the considering mm -hmm. calls and complain to us, we have to do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. We have to call the production manager. We have to call NYPD. We have to call the, the NCO officers. And a lot of time, you know, they're very helpful. But we have to do a lot of calling, and that is, should not no, how I, my staff should be spending the time. Actually, and we do call moments. Yeah, I, I mean, we say, call your we, staff, too. We would be doing that yeah. for you. I mean, that's really what our office is intended to be. Yeah, but is, it doesn't happen. Okay. Well, Commissioner, and that's why for today's hearing, uh -huh. we told a lot of people in the neighborhood, and they've submitted testimony, some of them are here today, mm -hmm. because it is something that is really hurting their quality of life. Like, it just can't be so often that they come in. And with the small businesses, there's a lot of disruption, mm -hmm. um, and film shoots happening not just during the day, but also at night. It was in that, it was a couple of weeks ago, we were walking home, we usually just cross Columbus Park and we were told, no, you cannot cross because they're filming there. We had to go somewhere else. Huh, okay. uh, yes, there's a lot of production company, big and small. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes, there are no bilingual staff. So one of your code of conduct talks about get to know the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Well, if you know the neighborhood speaks Spanish or Chinese, you should have some staff mm -hmm. politely tell people uh, there's a production going on and you have to go this way. Mm -hmm. That goes a long way. Absolutely. Rather than there was one incident which my staff complained where somebody was making fun of the people and say, oh, why are they so scared of us? Do they think that we're ICE? Ugh. Yeah, I mean, we took the name of the person. We filed the complaint. He had to go to a sensitivity training session. I mean, it's kind of like if you are in someone's neighborhood, be nice. Agreed. Right? Yes. And support the local businesses. Mm -hmm. And I know the, the complaint that we have, you know, from a lot of local businesses, they see the, the catering, that they have the big spread out there. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you got all these local restaurants that right. the production company can patronize. Mm -hmm. And there are production companies that does that. Yes. They give vouchers yes. you know, to their staff, and they go and they support the local businesses. And that's great, and we should really mandate more of that. The other thing is that those humongous trailer, we have a law in New York City that you're not supposed to idle for more than five minutes. Mm -hmm. A lot of those trailers are idling, and it's causing pollution. I mean, nobody is checking on that. And that, that should stop. But there were good production company. You know what they did? They actually rented some of the hotel rooms for their actors to change and, and do whatever they need to do so that they don't have to have the big trailer. Mm -hmm. right? And then there are good production company that actually go around, mm -hmm. talk to the neighborhood, talk to the small business, and they do compensate uh, the small businesses. So the good things do happen. There are, as you say, good actors, right? And we need more of those. Yes. And maybe in your code of conduct or whatever, you need to sort of encourage more of those. Because once you come into a neighborhood, we want to make sure that everyone benefits. Mm -hmm. Not just seeing the picture in the screen or the TV, but that actually the small businesses can also benefit you know, from the production. And sometimes they're there for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we really want to work with you and see how we can turn this positive thing into something that everyone yes. can benefit and so that my office will not get these constant complaints. Yes. Um, I know we have, I don't have the exact number, I'm sure we can look it up and I'm sure you can tell me in terms of in District 1 Lower Manhattan the number of film shoots permit that was given out every year. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, we love our neighborhood, mm -hmm. but we do need a break. Yes. And so it's, does the moratorium there still go into effect? I mean, can neighborhood request the moratorium? We do put certain locations on, on hiatus, uh, and that is a decision where, you know, we look closely at the circumstances, because when we're doing that, we're obviously taking a location off the map for productions to film. But we have worked with your office to do that in certain cases. But if there's not, there's a sort of a 
number of factors that we look at when we are determining whether or not to put a, a, a neighborhood on, a, on hiatus. And so we'll look at the amount of construction in the area, transportation, you know, the, uh, road work, other activities that are happening in addition to production. Production is one of those factors. Uh, but yes, if there are specific issues in a community, I would welcome the opportunity to discuss those with you so that we can figure out if the hiatus is the appropriate way to go or if there are other ways that we can be staging and landing productions in your districts. And you are correct, I have yet to meet with you, but I will be coming to your office. It's uh, you know, I've, I've been in office for five months and I've been trying to meet with everyone. And so I, I will be coming to your office to have these conversations. Well, we definitely look forward to meeting with you. And thank you, Chair, for hosting this meeting. My staff was so excited and they kept, you know, spreading the word out there. And I think some of the testimony will come in because people's quality of life are, you know, being affected. But ultimately, I think for our small businesses, yes. There's so much ways that, I mean, the video I, you show is great. Yeah. That should be all the small business. They should welcome the film shoot, right? If they're coming into the neighborhood mm -hmm. and they patronize the small business there, mm -hmm. that is a great thing. And we do not get calls from the production company. Okay. Okay? Yep. Maybe once in a blue moon, mm -hmm. uh, a, one production company would call and ask us, though they're coming in, right. or their organization in the community um, that they should make donation to, and we refer them to the community board. But we definitely don't get any notice. Okay. I mean, we get emails from your office, right. and that's about it. So one thing I just, I wanna be sure that I'm making clear to the um, council is, I really am committed to making this work. I really do want to make sure that we are working in lockstep with you. I think we both share um, a desire to make sure that this industry works well and that we are minimizing the impacts to the communities. The best way for us to do that is to understand the specific needs of each of the communities and also to highlight the good actors and set them up as good examples. That is something that I have been, ha that I've been doing in all of my conversations with productions, as well as in my conversations with your, um, our colleagues in um, city council. Uh, you know, some of the things that we've been talking about is really working with the productions to do outreach to the uh, community boards, the um, borough president, the council members, uh, and really be proactive in working with them from the start. Uh, you know, we do have a variety of productions that work in uh, in New York City. So I, I, I also don't want to uh, be mis, uh, misunderstood that like every single production that comes to a community is going to reach out to your office because truly if they're only there for a day and like half a day or whatever that it's, it's not the same kind of investment that we're looking at but for those that have recurring locations or have big shoots absolutely we are going to be working with them more concertedly to make sure that they're working with you and us to address these concerns. Well, well, to, to that, Commissioner, um, I think your office should require a checklist that uh, is sent to the production companies, and you have to get it back with the, ch with the production company checking off each item that they actually completed, count, you know, uh, notifying the community board, uh, the uh, local uh, bids, uh, LDCs, uh, and the council members. And just checking in, like, checking in, like the council member said, um, to make sure that there's the outreach, because again, as uh, I want to recommend, uh, I want to uh, recognize Councilmember Levin, who, who just walked in, who has a lot of film shoots in his district. We know of that. As I work down in downtown Brooklyn, um, I don't know if they're still shooting in in the Brooklyn Heights, which uh, it was a hotbed for production and, and actually caused problems. In, in I remember 2013, it was a moratorium because mm -hmm. the neighbors were just under constant yes. film shoots. But I, I just want to move on to uh, Council Member Barron, who um, actually has a couple of bills that we want to get your feedback on also, Commissioner. Thank you to the chairs. And uh, I'll be brief because I have another committee hearing across the hall that I have to be in and they're ending soon. So my Questions will be very brief. Thank you for having the meeting prior. And in our meeting, we talked about having a bill of rights, and you indicated that you do have a code of conduct, mm -hmm. which is presently in place, which governs how it is that uh, the film companies are supposed to conduct themselves. And what I'm saying to you, a, the con a code of conduct is really targeted to the companies. 
and we're looking to establish a Bill of Rights which will be targeted in addressing the issues of the community and the residents. So what is your response to that? The Code of Conduct is uh, in place for the productions to work well in the communities. Um, the Community Bill of Rights, while I certainly appreciate where that is coming from, each community is going to be different, and so my concern about codifying such a code is that it, we won't be able to deal with the specific needs of each of the communities. So I'm, I'm happy to look at that more closely, but I think what we really need to be focused on is enforcing the code of conduct to the specific needs of each of the communities. Because Do you really agree that this designed. code of conduct is for companies? It's Even though it's their behavior and it's, right, production companies, absolutely. right. A bill of rights is for individuals and community organizations. There's a different focus, there's a different target. So we perhaps can draw from this code of conduct, but I certainly believe that individuals in a community who have all the issues they're hearing about need to know that there's a document specifically targeting what their issues and concerns are. And this Bill of Rights would be produced from your office and we would be able to have it with a comment period for 90 days after you, we're allowing you to produce it because you're the office that does that. So we're asking you to draft it and then it would go to the community for a 90 day comment period and then it would be finalized. So it would draw in fact from the code of conduct, which goes to film companies, but would focus on the individuals who are the people who are saying that they're being abused, they're not being respected, their communities are being uh, left in conditions that are not appropriate. And yes, each community is different, but there's a generic, basic understanding of what all communities are entitled to. Right, Re respectfully, council member, if the communities are feeling that they have their rights haven't been respected, it, it would be because a code of conduct or like Precisely. was violated. And Correct. so that I, I guess that's that's why I'm a little bit hesitant to understand the need for two documents governing the same. Because kind this of one is not what is an agreement between the media, your office and residents. This is for film companies, and it says that the production manager signs this. Mm -hmm. So even though it talks about the residents and what the film company should do to respect the residents, there's nothing here that talks about residents knowing what their entitlements are. So that's the difference. And ag again, I would think that this would serve as listing eight, 10, 12, whatever, very precise entitlements residents and communities have. I think it would be helpful to go through and see how they track against each other, and then absolutely, I'm happy to, okay. to look at that with you. Very good, thank you. Um, and, and part of the uh, issues that we're hearing about is uh, inability for traffic to go through because these streets are designated. What provisions do you make for school buses that might be needing to get into that block to drop off children or for accessoride with handicapped people when, to be able to get into those blocks? When we're permitting productions, we're not closing streets. We're designating parking, but by and large, there is supposed to be uh, acce uh, accessible pedestrian and traffic flow. Um, the, the rare instances in which we will close a block is if there's going to be like an explosion or something where we, you know, we're concerned about public safety, but um, there, tr through traffic is supposed to, is, is what's required. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, productions themselves aren't allowed to close streets. Okay. Um, when, you, when we have a request like that, that's one of the scenarios where we would assign one of the movie unit police officers to be there. And what we'll do, you know, say there's a walk and talk with a show, the officer will intermittently hold okay. traffic. Okay. But obviously, if there's a school bus, mm -hmm. okay. he'll pull that right through. Great. And my second bill is uh, that I'm proposing is establishing a task force. We've heard about many of the situations and conditions that communities are being subjected to. And this would establish a task force to, in a very organized way, look at all of the issues that exist 
and the staff gather data for the situations and conditions that have been um, brought forward and to suggest how communities might be able to benefit in some tangible way from the uh, inconveniences that are done. For example, as has been said, local, local businesses, it, I believe it says that their film companies are encouraged to use local businesses. But perhaps if we have a task force, we could explore how in fact we might want to set some minimal uh, percentage or target or goal, we don't like to say. So we set a goal that we want to establish in terms of interacting and pouring some of that revenue directly back into the community that's being inconvenient. So what is your opinion about that? Uh, so we did discuss this a bit, and I, you know, I, again, I appreciate the spirit of um, uh, setting up such a task force. I, I think, however, given the resources of the agency, I would prefer to see that those resources focused on building the relationships in the communities so that we can address some of the concerns that the task force is looking to. Um, Could that be a part of what the task force would do? Uh, I'm sorry? Your objective could be a part of what the task force would include in their study and in their research. When, when we're talking about a task force, are we talking about dedicating MOM resources to a particular team that would focus on those issues? We're talking about uh, representatives being appointed from the mayor, the public advocate, from your office, uh, to look at all of the problems that exist, to gather data, to do a survey mm -hmm. uh, of the general public and local businesses in particular to see what it is that we can do that would bring some of the financial mm -hmm. benefits that these companies are experiencing and set a way for the community to be able to benefit. We don't want to, when we spoke, you said, well, we don't want to have an extortionist kind of uh, policy. That's absolutely right but a task force might look to examine what it is that economically we can say these companies should do to benefit the, ex the communities where they're operating. Right, uh, again, it, so long as we would, uh, the focus of our um, resources could be like, again, my focus on MOM resources is to really like address head on some of these other issues that we're trying to manage effectively, but certainly if we feel that a task force would better inform those practices, I, I'm more than happy to, con to work with you on that. Very good. Thank you so much. Again, appreciate your time. Thank you to the Thank chairs. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Councilman Yeager. Mr. Chairman, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, can I, uh, can I, a neighborhood, well, let me start with something else. Uh, have, has your agency ever said no to a film production? And what I mean by no is not the date, but to the location. Mm -hmm. We say no a lot, actually. Okay. Um, by the time you see a permit, we've probably said no a lot. Okay. Um, productions come to us with crazy ideas about what they want to do. Um, and so we spend a lot of time negotiating with them to make sure that uh, we are landing productions appropriately. Does your no involve simply curtailing to a shorter space the area that they need or to simply moving them out of the neighborhood that they've chosen? It really depends, and I'm not trying, you know, I mean, it really depends on the scenario. I mean, we've had productions that say that they want to shut down the Brooklyn Bridge because they want to do a chase scene. We're obviously not going to let them do that. Okay. We're not going to shut down the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, there are certain areas of New York where productions just really can't, function, depending on the size and the scale of the production, they won't work, and so we will direct them to another location. But it really is a case-by-case -case basis, and, um, but yes, we say no all the time, and Dean can probably uh, speak more to that. We um, <clears throat> deny thousands of proposals every year, um, but what, one of our philosophies is to work with the production. Sometimes it just needs a modification, Sometimes it needs a complete change of venue. We sort of adopt the same rationale as the police department, which is time, place, and manner. And if they don't satisfy those three criteria for us, you know, we'll work with the show or the feature film. I mean, we just did it with a Steven Spielberg movie. They're making a remake of West Side Story. 
15 of the proposals they had for where they wanted to film giant dance sequences were all denied. So they readjusted, they rescouted, found the places that were appropriate, that they could still execute the creative vision, but it wasn't gonna be inconvenient or a huge traffic nightmare for the police department. So, you know, in answer to your question, the, the only time we really will flat out reject a permit is most often because they've come to the wrong agency. You know, we might have a, an entity that, that came to us because they're filming something, but what they're filming is a promotional event with branding and a marketing stunt. So in that circumstance, we will flat out reject it and transfer them over to the street activity permit office so they can assess the appropriate fees and issue the permit because that's their jurisdiction. So that's really only few circumstances that we reject, but we work to, you know, modify to make things work for our constituents, but also get the creative vision that they need for the show. Okay. If a, if a neighborhood, uh, either via its community board or its council member, uh, should decide uh, through its own conversations that they wanted its neighborhood, that neighborhood, to simply not have productions, not 12 days a year, not 20 days a year, but 365 days, just go somewhere else, don't come to our neighborhood. Can they make that request to you and it be uh, adhered to? Sure. Um, let me explain the grounds under which our hotspot policy is based. Our hotspot policy is based on our film permit rules, and the specific regulation is 43 RCNY 9-02B7, and that sets forth six grounds under which we may deny a film permit, and it's those grounds that inform the hotspot policy. I'm not going to read all of those grounds to you, but let me use one of those grounds to illustrate an example. One of the grounds is that use of the location would interfere unreasonably with the operation of city functions. So in some cases, we know ahead of time, for example, that the New York City Department of Transportation is planning on doing road work in an area, and we're able to forecast ahead of time that we'll have to deny any film permits that come in for that particular area. So we put that area on the hotspot list, and um, the hotspot list goes to production companies so that they know that they shouldn't apply for a permit in that area. There are five other grounds in that rule that we consider, and so when we hear from communities, we have to base our determination on whether to place an area um, on the hotspot list based on what the law says. What are those five grounds? Well, that's not the law. That's, that's just to no. be clear, that's not the law. The law is the administrative code. That's your rule, <coughs> right? That's a promulgated rule of your agency. A promulgated rule is a law. A promulgated rule is not a law. A promulgated rule is the interpretation of the agency and its right to, in, to, to create a rule based on the administrative code and the charter, but it can be changed by you any time. So let's hear the, what the other five uh, rules are. Uh, uh, I'll explain the, okay. the other five grounds. Um, one ground is that conditions exist that may pose a danger or a threat to participants, onlookers, or the general public. The next is the location sought is not suitable because the proposed use cannot reasonably be accommodated in the proposed location. The date and time requested for a particular location is not available because one, a permit has been previously issued for such date and time, or two, the permit request is the subject of a new project account application, um, and then there's an internal site, or three, another city agency has issued a permit for such date or time. The fourth ground is that the film office has concluded based on specific information that the applicant is unlikely to comply with the material terms of the requested permit. The fifth is the use of the location or the proposed activity at the location would otherwise violate any law, ordinance, statute, or regulation. And I've already explained the sixth one. Okay, so if I were to tell you that I just don't want you to issue permits in my neighborhood, that's not covered by your rule? 
No, it's would not. you consider adopting a rule that would say that any community board can declare itself uh, a safe space from the uh, from the film production permitting uh, issuance that you do? The film permit rules take into consideration First Amendment rights of filmmakers that use the city streets. Just just to be just to be clear, First Amendment is not for commercial purposes. First Amendment is when a when a uh, when when law and order decides that it wants to shut down some streets because it wants to film an outdoor scene of Detective Stabler chasing somebody, there's no First Amendment in there. There is a First Amendment right, and the city government can regulate First Amendment protected rights for the safety, but saying that there's no First Amendment right is incorrect. Okay. Okay. No. Can my neighborhood declare itself uh, uh, to be exempt from uh, uh, from film production permitting with your support with a rule that says that any neighborhood that decides that it wants to chart its own destiny and be exempt from having filming done in its neighborhood can so declare? If you're, I, I think- Would your agency promulgate or consider promulgating such a rule? It would be irresponsible for me to sit here and tell you what we could or couldn't do without okay. discussing all right. Um, your your testimony indicates that uh, that filming uh, produ produces for that the filming uh, industry spends nine billion dollars a year and produces four hundred million dollars in tax revenue. Um, I don't know where that nine billion dollars a year gets spent, but I can tell you that when uh, when a company decides to shut down six blocks and take up six blocks of parking. They don't use our dry cleaners, they don't use our caterers, they don't use our food stores, they don't use our local bodegas or groceries to even buy a Diet Coke. They spend no money in the neighborhood. They bring everything on their own. If anybody working on that scene wants to get a drink, they don't walk into a store and buy a drink. They walk into the truck and get their drink for free. They spend no money in the neighborhood. They just bring chaos. And I recognize that $9 billion is a lot of spending to be done in the city and $400 million in revenue is great to have on our books, but if you give me the city's budget and a red pen in a half hour, I could save us $400 million. So I'm not that concerned with whether or not we lose $400 million in revenue, but I am concerned with some of uh, what I've seen in uh, my time in office and on a community board for 18 years before I took office. When they come into a neighborhood, they don't bring anything but bad. They just don't. And uh, maybe, maybe in other neighborhoods they bring excellent, but in my neighborhoods, uh, when they show up, they're not bringing anything good with them, they're just bringing chaos. They're bringing, they're bringing loss of parking, uh, they're bringing it at times that are inconvenient to our neighborhoods for uh, not just uh, for terms of, of permanent operation of a neighborhood like any other neighborhood in the city, but also because that, you know, if they want to film on a Saturday, people have to move their cars in some parts of my neighborhood on Friday and find parking. Um, and we've had, as you know, uh, situations, I don't know, if it wasn't actually under you, it was under your predecessor, where the signage went up so late uh, that people had already parked their cars on Friday, and then sundown comes, and they're no longer in a position to move. Here comes the signs, here comes the tow trucks, and the cars are gone, and come Saturday, and all the great cameras are showing up. So that's a problem, and I'm not blaming you for it, uh, but what I'm saying is that I think that if uh, they just simply stayed out of some neighborhoods that were declared uh, safe spaces, uh, then I think we could alleviate a lot of this problem. And I'm not suggesting that they all go camp out in Councilmember Chin's district either, um, but uh, these are our streets, they're not their streets. These streets belong to the taxpayers of the city, they don't belong to the film production companies. I'm a big, big fan of law and order, and I recognize how much of what they do is on the streets of New York City. I just don't want them to film in my neighborhood. And I think that we ought to be able to figure out a way to make certain residential neighborhoods exempt uh, from the burdens that come along with the permitting that you issue. And uh, if, if you're not able to promulgate a rule that would allow a community board to chart its own destiny and to make its neighborhood safe uh, from the obstructionism that comes along with these, uh, with these productions, then perhaps we ought to consider that here in the council uh, because I don't agree with your assessment that a statute or a rule along those lines would violate the United States Constitution. That wasn't really a question, so I'm good. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your time. I yield back. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Ayala. 
Hi, good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. Um, I actually did have the pleasure of meeting with you uh, just yesterday. Um, my question, really, I just, I want to just uh, piggyback on Council Member Yeager's um, comment about the, the, the small business is not really making any money um, when these production sites are in, in our communities. Uh, I, I believe that that is an accurate uh, statement and I don't know what, if anything, you'd be able to do about it, but I think you know we, we definitely wanna go on record to say that we support our small businesses and we encourage and hope that anyone that's patronizing or using our streets um, as a means of you know promoting anything uh, is also helping you know those local businesses to thrive um, I wonder however regarding the small businesses there is some compensation that is uh, provided uh, to small businesses by some of the production companies when they're on a specific block do you know how the the, the amount of, of Compen the, the amount that the compensation uh, equals out to is, is negotiated? Is that by, by neighborhood? It varies from production to production. You know, the productions have their own budgets, um, and so it depends on, you know, what the production is able to um, do in specific communities. So as I mentioned, the, the size and scale and scope of the productions that we're permitting range in size. Um, and so those are business decisions on the part of the productions. That said, however, we have been, we have had a number of success stories where we've worked with the productions to really work with the neighborhoods to do walk away lunches, to hire locally, to, you know, we've had a couple of productions just in, in the recent, um, uh, recent months that have been very effective at doing that. And so what we are doing is working with them and having them model that for the other productions that are coming in. I guess because my, my concern is that my, one, of the con one of the complaints that I have, and I, I, I actually, these came to mind after our meeting yesterday from the small businesses, is the compensation equals to a couple of hundred dollars. And the loss of revenue is a lot higher than that for the day's worth of work. And so I think that there needs to be more oversight uh, to ensure that you know whatever compensation is equal to whatever the loss of revenue is for the day for that business and every business is different right um, but I'm also concerned about what the compensation looks like for mobile uh, street vendors because they're also impacted by these uh, these uh, productions and they get even less uh, compensation than the brick and mortar businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder if that's a conversation that you know you've had at any point, and if there's any plan uh, to kind of address this. Yeah, and I and thank you, and I do appreciate the um, picture of what's happening in your district, and that's why again I think it's really important for us to engage in these one-on-one -on -one discussions so that can we can really get a clearer picture of what's happening in these different neighborhoods. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't stress enough, it's always a challenge to figure out how to do street activity in this city that has so many diverse neighborhoods. And I think the best approach to that is to really work <coughs> hand in hand with you to see how we can address those when we are landing a production in your specific community. Because the, the needs in that community may look very different in another one. And we just want to make sure that we're calibrating appropriately and that we're, that we're um, uh, being flexible in our approach so that we can have a better win situation for everyone involved. Yeah. So I, I would add, um, if the code of, of conduct sheet was shared with my colleagues, mm -hmm. there are 51 of us, I think that only a few of us that sit on this committee, um, it would be really helpful. It would have been helpful to me two years ago to have a better understanding of what this was and how it impacted my community and, and the, you know, uh, the last uh, comment is really around the schools, and I would ask that special sensitivity be given to production companies that are granted permits around schools. A lot of my schools complain that they lose um, parking during the day. Um, a lot of our school teachers, unfortunately, travel uh, far mm -hmm. to, to be able to uh, teach at these schools, and parking is very limited as is. So when production companies come in and take up what little bit of space we do have available, it poses a huge problem for our, you know, our public uh, school teachers. And so 
Um, I would ask that you please, 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 please consider that when you're issuing permits uh, between uh, schools, the, the schools uh, operational hours. Absolutely, and I'm gonna, I, I do want my colleague to talk more specifically about that, but one thing that I think is just important to realize is that when my team is permitting productions throughout the city, they're just looking at a map. Right? But that map doesn't tell us what's on that block necessarily, and it doesn't tell us even the ebb and flow, because you could still say that there's a school, but maybe it's a school that doesn't, that's like under renovation or something like that, and we don't know. So again, this is why like, I can't stress enough like the conversations I've had with each of you and that I will continue to have with each of you are really critical. And it's not just me. My team is getting to know each of the communities as well. Uh, we are, you know, restructuring the office a bit to ensure that we can engage in these ongoing conversations to really better understand what's happening on the ground. But that said, I think it would be helpful to have Dean talk about the schools question in particular. We are very hypersensitive about productions around schools. Um, one of the things that we do, and it, it comes with all authorized parking, you know, we have a show that just um, vouchered all the district attorney's parking so they could film in a muni building. Um, when they submit a permit and it says request permission to clear this street, they have to stipulate on the permit what the parking regs are. And they'll stand in seven to seven commercial vehicles. And if there's any authorized parking on that request and it references that they're trying to take school parking, in order for us to sanction that, they have to get the principal to sign off on it. And then what the production do with either a voucher, all the teachers to go into a parking lot and pay for that, or what sometimes we do so it's not inconvenient, like not every neighborhood has parking lots. So what we'll do is we'll allocate a different space for the teachers to relocate to that's when it's the striking distance of the school, but only if the school approves it. I think that the issue is that you, the, the key word here is authorized parking and not the city no longer issues authorized parking for schools. And so if a school had a limited maybe four or five spaces in front of the school building, that's all that they had, but it doesn't mean that the school teachers are not parking in the immediate vicinity of that school building. So I, I don't know how you would be able to ascertain whether or not you're you know displacing teachers because if you're only looking at the authorized parking criteria, then it's flawed. Okay, so that's a circumstance in which it would be helpful to sort of sit with you as we're sort of looking at production that's landing in that neighborhood to work with you to figure out what is a more viable alternative to stage that park. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate thank it. You. We've been joined by uh, Council Member Levine and I wanna recognize now for questions, uh, Mark Levin. I mean, uh, Steve Levin. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, hi, Commissioner, how are you? Good to see you all. I um, just want to ask about the legislation that I am sponsoring, uh, 158, um, related to the uh, updating the fees for permits to film on city property. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can you explain a little bit, I, and I apologize for arriving late, can you explain a little bit about the fee structure? Sure. Because yes. um, the issue that we see is that, um, <clears throat> as, uh, as Dean mentioned before, West Side Story, Steven Spielberg, very large production. Um, uh, they're able to um, to afford to be able to pay, you know, reasonable fees or um, for the size of the production. Um, and also, there are film shoots that have to get uh, permits as well that are, you know, student productions or independent productions that are much smaller. And it's my understanding that they are, the same fee applies to um, uh, permits of all size. And so that doesn't, you know, obviously that doesn't quite make a lot of sense. And, and in reality, because of the tax benefit uh, that is provided to the film industry, um, which I think has been very successful in, in ensuring that the film industry stays in New York and has been able to grow in New York, um, um, but as a result, we are, um, because of where the fees are now, we're not really seeing the revenue generated to the city in a way that is, um, you know, is really commensurate with the size of the, of the, uh, the film economy, basically. So 
If you could speak to that a little bit. There are two, I'd like to make two points in response to your question, and thank you. Um, you it's been great working with you to sort of troubleshoot these issues, because you do have a lot of them in your districts, yes. <laughs> I recognize. Yes. Could, um, could, could you pull the mic a little closer? I'm sorry, well? yes, yeah. yes, sorry. I'm not really used to being on this side of the camera, microphone, what have you. But um, uh, with respect to the tax credit, I, I think it's important to note that the New York State tax credit is unique and actually very thoughtful in the way that it was set up because it is set up to reimburse below the line costs. And what that means in production speak is we're not paying for luxury items for like the A-list, like whatever, mm -hmm. like chocolate habit. Mm -hmm. We are paying for, um, we are incentivizing the creation of jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, so below the line costs, it's like your grips, your electrics, your hair and makeup and wardrobe and all of the people that build the sets and learn really strong trades and that can then turn around and make significant investments in their communities right here in New York City. So I, you know, I think it's one of the um, stronger credits that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the fees, you know, the fees we recognize and I totally appreciate um, and I'm looking to forward to working with you on this bill because our fee structure was set up over 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we were just trying to draw up production to New York and there hadn't been any fees. Um, if any of you were here, I think you'll remember there was a pretty significant discussion around it because there was a question about how we were gonna structure the fees in a way that was fair and equitable to take into account the huge diversity of filmmaking that occurs here in mm -hmm. New York. Um, the, the way that they arrived at the fee was that it was an application fee. It's not a permit fee on property. It's an application, it's a processing fee for the actual permit application. And so we do recognize, my office has recognized, that we need to revisit that. We're in a totally different time now. Mm -hmm. I think the studios have recognized as well. They, you know, we need to revisit that. And so uh, we, we have been working very closely uh, with legal, because there are certain legal requirements for mm -hmm. what we can charge in terms of fees, budgetary right. requirements, justifications that we have to make. Um, and so we are absolutely in support of that and look forward to working with you on that. The amount and the structure and mm -hmm. how that gets set right, up, right. I think we do need to take into account the legal requirements, the budgetary policy, as well as how the industry functions as w and how the city functions so that mm -hmm. we can make sure that it's appropriately structured. Great, great. Because yeah, uh, certainly we don't want anything to be arbitrary and it shouldn't be up to just one person's judgment about, you know, how much, uh, you know, a production should be, um, uh, should be uh, paying for a for an application, um, but but at the same time, it's it's you know we do recognize that there's a large economy here, yes. and um, it is using public resources, and mm -hmm. um, uh, in light of that, um, you know it, it's it, it, there's the city is the you know is the entity of the of the public in this instance, and so. It makes I agree. Sense there does need yeah. to be a restructuring of it, yeah. for sure. We've Great. been working on that. I look forward to sharing those notes with you and um, Chairman Holden uh, to see how we can move that conversation along. Um, you know, I think, look, at the end of the day, <coughs> everybody wants a certain level of predictability, right? Mm -hmm. The industry wants it. We want it as New Yorkers. We want to know what to expect. Um, and I think by revisiting that structure and coming up with mm -hmm. a sound structure, we can do that. That'd be great. And I look forward to also working with the industry as well, because obviously they're an important part of this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Levine. If, if I just may, uh, wait, wait, just let me speak. Chair, I just want to know whenever you have that information that was requested. I have, um, I have it. Okay, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna come back to you. Just wanna make sure you have it. Okay. Oh, I have it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Chairs Holden and Joe and I for convening this uh, very important hearing and great to see you again, Commissioner. You know, I represent a district in Northern Manhattan that um, may be home, if not the most production, certainly one of the most heavily used by the production industry. I also represent a district which is home to, uh, I would estimate, thousands of people who work in uh, this industry as well. Uh, not the big executive types, but uh, union members, people who are on the job for whom this is a, a really uh, wonderful uh, and meaningful career. Uh, so on the one hand, I um, am always pushing for uh, ways to lessen the impact on neighborhoods where these productions are taking place, whether it's, I don't know, smaller trucks, uh, whether it's 
turning to local merchants for food as opposed to bringing everything in. Um, finding ways to bring local young people in uh, as mentors and protégés to learn about this incredible industry. <clears throat> I, th I think there's a lot we can do and should do to continue to push uh, uh, to reduce the adverse impact on communities um, and expand the benefits. And th there are good productions which have done this. Uh, we just finished In the Heights uptown, mm -hmm. and um, it was a very large-scale production. I think it went on for like two months. It was pretty intense, but uh, they, they really did a good job at community outreach, and um, we had very, very few complaints relative to most productions of that size. Um, regarding some of the legislation here today, uh, I, I know that it's gone. I, I, I do commend uh, Council Member Levin for reconsidering the fee structure, and uh, I, I, I have no problem with uh, charging Steven Spielsberg a little bit more to process the paperwork, but I would be really sensitive to the impact on smaller productions mm -hmm. and to the possible inconsistency mm -hmm. in a city where we have the policy of tax credits to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars to promote the growth of the industry here, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, looking right. to increase fees feels a little contradictory. Mm -hmm. um, and then re regarding the proposal intro 1700, which would require a 14-day mm -hmm. advisory period, um, what little I know about the production industry, man, that's going to be really hard to implement in practice. Um, I mean, these guys are working with scripts that are being written three time zones away in LA often, where the changes can be day to day that can totally impact the production schedule. These folks are dealing with weather conditions and a storm might upend the filming schedule and, uh, and you don't have 14 days accurate weather forecasts. I, I, I would be worried that this would be the kind of thing that would push some people to produce in other cities. Yes. Um, and, and I don't think any of us want that. I don't think there's any council member or any uh, person who cares about the city who wants that. I love Toronto. I don't want this film production going to Toronto. Um, again, I think we can work around the margins to find ways to lessen impacts on neighborhoods. But I just worry that a 14-day uh, advisory period would have severe unintended consequences. Um, and I don't know if the administration has taken a position. I didn't see any remarks. I, I apologize. I didn't hear you deliver them. Um, I, I thank you. Okay. Uh, and I actually do share your concerns about the 14-day notification period. Um, we are a television town, um, and television functions on a very different schedule. Uh, the benefit of being in a television town is that they are regular jobs, like the schedule is more regular than, say, features. That's not to say I don't want features to come in. We had three lovely features that came in and created a lot of job opportunities for New Yorkers, but as television is uh, more serialized and more regular, that provides, again, a level of predictability for New Yorkers to have jobs and support their local economy. Um, I, I think it's probably better if some of my colleagues will tell, some of the, um, uh, our partners in industry can attest to the fact that the way that television works is uh, they are, the demands for content are so great now, uh, particularly in the streaming. And uh, that's what I'm hearing across the board. It's not just New York, it's in LA, it's, but it's worldwide this demand for content is happening and decisions about productions are being made very quickly. The turnaround time on these is very quick. So. Someone today is writing the script for what they're going to shoot in a week, right? Um, and so we're working with them to figure out how they're going to land that. 14 days will definitely kill the industry. I mean, I, I just I can't mince words about that. That's, that's not how television works, and they will go away. And I definitely don't want to see that. I also understand that communities want a level of predictability and certainty about when productions are gonna happen. And that is why we have tailored the notification period to when we know things are gonna happen with utmost accuracy. I know we don't like to be inconvenienced in New York and so I don't want people to be making plans unnecessarily to change things up only to be to have that shift later on. And so the, two, the 48 hours that we provide um, 
is in line with a lot of our other city projects that happen. A lot of street activities are permitted within that time frame. And then in terms of industry practice, that is the standard for these kinds of productions. That allows us to be sure that of what's going to happen within that time period. We can predict the weather a little bit better. We can be sure that when we're telling communities that this is going to happen, that it's really going to happen. So thank you for that. Okay, I, I appreciate you saying that, and, and I'll wrap up. I'm just, I'm, I'm glad that, 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 Mr. Chairman, that we have the Small Business Committee here as well, because there's a whole ecosystem of small businesses mm -hmm. around this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're wringing our hands a lot right now in the City Council about how hard it is yes. for small business in New York City today. And we shouldn't be making it any tougher um, and so I, I do want to go on record with, with my opposition to the 14-day uh, requirement, and I do appreciate your thoughts on this, and I want to thank both the chairs for uh, allowing me to uh, go a little bit longer on time. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you to the chairs. Yeah, we, we see other cities, though, for three to five-day requirement. We understand that. Uh, but the 14-day is really an offshoot of the lack of oversight from the administration. Again, it's putting the small businesses on the front lines to take the brunt of the, and the impact of filming for several days in front of their businesses. So this is, uh, again, we have to look at extending it. It has to be longer than the, tw the 48 hours because we're not getting cooperation from MOM or the administration and we're not getting the outreach from the production companies, which we established is in your code of conduct, yet you're, it's, I never get a call from a production company. Maybe you do, maybe other council members do, um, but we haven't heard one today that gets a regular call from a production company in advance of shooting, which is required. So that you're seeing now a reaction from council members who, who are saying something needs to be done. If you want, uh, if you want to keep the 48 hours, uh, then you have to provide the outreach, outreach and absolutely. checking that everyone is, is uh, playing by the rules and our small businesses and our communities are not on the front lines bearing the brunt. But I want to just um, ask a question. Um, you said you issued 14,500 permits in 2018. Mm -hmm. According to the open data portal, we have 9,000? 9,004. That's on the on the um, near, uh, in the open portal. Mm -hmm. So we what's uh, do you have um, an explanation as to why the discrepancy? I, I would have to look and see okay. what that data. Of those fourteen, the, of those fourteen thousand five hundred, how many were denied, or are those just all the permits that were the issued? Permits that were issued. And how many applications did you get for permits? Uh, that I, I would. You have don't to have that. Okay. Correct. Um, you, you wanted to say something on, on the numbers, right? Councilman Jonah. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, I would really hope that in preparing for this type of a hearing, first of its kind, again, that we would be prepared with, if we approved 14,500, mm -hmm. how many were applied for and how many were denied? Actually, can I, uh, th so at the point at which someone applies for a permit, that's really at the end of the conversations that we've had. It's not, I, I don't, it's a little bit difficult to explain, but it's, it's not like, I want to make a film, I'm going to go to New York, I'm just going to file a permit. Like there's so much information that the permit requires that they have to have conversations with our office before they actually file that application. Um, there's insurance requirements, there's a whole host of requirements that go into submitting that application. So at the point at which they're submitting their application, they're actually, like we've We've ironed out most of the issues that they're going to do. So there's, it's, it's not like the application would get rejected. The project proposal would get rejected before the application even gets submitted. Do you think we have enough time to figure out how many applications were denied in all of 2018? But, but that's what I'm saying. There's no denial of an application because at the time that they're applying for the, app, for the permit, any proposals that we would have rejected, we've already rejected. They're not gonna apply for a permit unless they know that they're gonna get a permit. And the only way that they're gonna know that they get a permit is if they have a conversation with our office to iron out all of those details. So, uh, then I'm not understanding. Yeah, I mean, so when they make, when they actually notify you of the intent of, and the desire to apply for a permit, well, there's, there's multiple phone calls that will take place. You know, we wanna do a driving sequence. Um, can you recommend where we could do it? Although they'll present the scenario where they wanna do the driving sequence. 
Then they'll go scout it with NYPD. NYPD might set forth conditions. NYPD might say, no, we're gonna do it on this avenue instead of this avenue. Then they have a production meeting at our office, you know, weeks before they start production. We'll sit there with a, a one-liner that breaks down every shooting day for the film. <clears throat> They'll present maps that'll show where they wanna park, what's for picture. So at that production meeting, we may look at everything and say, uh, no, we got, I know this block well, and Councilman Chin's a block, and um, it's not gonna be a place we're gonna let you park. Or they, they may have proposed something that was in our hot zone. So we're gonna tell them at the production meeting, that's not gonna work. Sometimes NYPD actually comes to the meeting if it's a complex job, you know, like in the Heights or West Side Story, so that they can get answers in real time. So by the time, the, like the commissioner said, by the time they actually press submit, they've already had their proposals modified to a place that works for our constituents, works for our office, and gets them their creative. I, I don't wanna cut you short. Have you identified earlier on that there are some bad actors? Bad actors? Yes. Yes. What have you done to go after those bad actors? Have they been blackballed? Have um, they been well, informed you know, it, that they'll no longer get a... I mean, years, you know, uh, one extreme example was, um, you know, we don't let sanction crew cars on the set. And we had a very big movie, and we revoked their permits, and we wouldn't let them film in New York the next day, which cost them about $450,000. The thing you have to remember, too, is that you know, these shows are not one-offs. They're here 26 episodes. They're on the ground for 10 months. If they mess up on Monday, they're gonna have a hard time working with us. Thank you, Mr. McGinn. Did you get that list of today's yes, permits? Yes, I was just gonna email it to you. I was hoping that there was a show like Law & Order filming right around the block on 60 Center Street that we could go work at or look at that an officer was assigned to. I'm sending it to you now. Um, everything is uptown. Columbus Avenue, 78th Street, but I'm, I'm emailing it to you right now, sir. So how many permits are there currently um, issued for today? Um, I'll tell you in one second. You want that list also? It's pretty significant. You want me to just count them out? Just give me a number. And then we hope to verify it on your portal, but. How many? 58? 58 permits were issued for today. There's another part to this though, is you have a show, and I'll use Law and Order because their names come up several times, but we issue one permit per day, per job. But sometimes those permits may have two locations on them, or three locations on them. You know, Law and Order shoots interior bodega, then they come outside, they do a walk and talk, a block away exterior to a brownstone, and then they might company move to their stage on Chelsea Piers. So the numbers are deceiving. It's not something that we wanted, but that's how the programmers of the citywide event database created it years ago. Of the, you emailed me the 58, because we're gonna try to figure out how to evaluate those 58 permits. And I have staff standing by that are willing to run out to one of the sites and illustrate what they see, live stream, and then I'll show you the breakdown. You know, I, this is the importance of, and I'm not vilifying commissioner of the industry. Mm -hmm. I wanna point out again, we identified a problem mm -hmm. and now it's about solutions. Absolutely. And if we can't get a 24-7 live person to answer that phone to address any of the issues and concerns. It is a breakdown. Mm -hmm. Of the 58, I dare to imagine how many of them have notified the community board. Mm -hmm. How many of them have notified the city council, the block and merchant associations in which they are filming at least 48 hours in advance of the shoot. I am reasonably confident that you will see a noticeable change within this next 
six months of my tenure here. Um, I have, as I said, made a concerted effort to meet with each of you to understand the needs of the communities, to work with production, to be more proactive, and uh, I, just knowing the industry, I know how it works, and so I, I feel like I can be a good partner both with our productions to make sure that they're, they're being good neighbors, as well as with you, because I care about the city, and I want to make sure, and, I, and actually I want to correct that that, that dichotomy, because production does care about the city. That's why they're here. They're here for the local talent. They're here for the culture. They're here because they want to be here. There could be many other jurisdictions that they are in, and they've chosen New York, which is not an easy place, as we've said, right? And so my task at hand is to make sure that we make this an industry that works for everyone in, in the same way that we present it. Those are not anomalies. We have two, at least 2,000 small businesses that are working with productions. And I would love to create an environment in which the small businesses that are impacted by this can be positively impacted. And that is my goal, is to work with you towards that vision. I appreciate that, and that's what I'm looking for. So in the next, or a, the next version of the Code of Conduct, in big bold letters it should say, shop local, support small businesses. I would imagine that would be in their best interest as well. But um, as I look at that list, and I'm sure the chair has other questions, uh, we'll be looking at the issues. And if we, if 311 is the answer, or the number that's posted mm -hmm. uh, is the answer, and we clearly identify it is not working, then the definition of insanity comes to question. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, and we don't want that. And I embrace the industry. We just need them to be partners, and that's going to require all of the stakeholders, including your office, the production companies, community boards, residents, small businesses, bids, merchants associations, schools and houses of worship, and everyone else working together to make sure that we all benefit, that the hardships or burdens aren't placed on any one particular individual or business or community. That's the intent of this hearing mm -hmm. and the and purpose of the And I appreciate the opportunity to have this be the beginning of that conversation with you, so thank you. I just want to ask a question on the 311 complaints. You, you mentioned how many complaints uh, were registered on 311? Uh, the, we received less than 900, um, 900 inquiries through 311. There were 300 complaints on the permit, the 14,500 permits? Some of them may have not been complaints, but yes, for the sake of argument, yes. It's but you determined they were complaints about the film shooting or production or, or trucks or whatever, right? The inquiries, uh, inquiries. you know, yeah. Because they, they could just be questions about production or questions about our office generally. It doesn't really distinguish in that way necessarily. And you got that, you determined that from 311 gave you that information because we couldn't get it. Yeah, I think well, we can get back to you on, on, the, on right. how we arrived at that, but that's. Okay, anything else? Um, the, how long is the, um, in Los Angeles, they have a 14-day permit. Uh, they'll issue a permit for 14 days. What, do we have a number, you know, there's two weeks, three weeks? Their uh, notification? Yes. Is two days. Two days, 20, two days. 48 no, hours. The, the length of the permit. The, the length of the permit? Oh, the length of the permit. Uh, I thought it was 30 days. And like in LA, it'll be 14 days. The whole permit will, will, uh, will for shooting, will be 14 days max, right? Yep. 14 so, days and something like 10 locations or something like that. I'm sure my, I'm sure the industry represented here could speak to that specifically. So we, okay, so. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things that's been discussed for a while, and this almost was executed during the previous administration, they just didn't get to it in the end, was adopting a time frame mm -hmm. similar to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the job that's here for a two day commercial isn't paying, is paying the same thing but the job that shoots 365 days a year, the Today Show, or the Colbert Show for CBS, the permits would only be valid 14 days 
I think in something I saw from the council, you wanted 30 days. So it's one of the conversations that the commissioner's been having yeah. when evaluating changing the fee schedule, having it end at a certain duration, which is much more appropriate than just paying once and being able to shoot for 26 episodes for 10 months. And that is what I was referencing when I was saying that we are looking at how to structure that, like setting time limits, setting locations, something like that. And so we've been really working closely on that and hope to have a proposal soon. So just on, on what's the usual cost in your, for your office to review uh, and process a film permit? The standard uh, application, the standard processing fee is $300 per permit. Yeah, you, that's just a fee, but what's, what's the cost to, to, your, to your office, to, to actually the personnel? to work on it, let's say an individual working for three hours, two hours? We're in the process of collecting information in order to determine those costs. And um, there's a significant body of case law that, that uh, governs how governmental entities may set their regulatory fees. So we're following the process that has been set up for every, every city agency through OMB. Um, we're looking at the direct costs, the executive costs, administrative costs, office space and utilities, and other agency costs. And where we've collected a lot of that information, but we don't yet have the final average uh, fee for, per permit yet. Okay, but the three the three hundred dollar permit. How long has that been in effect? Is it? That's what I mean. Oh, sorry. Sorry. That's been in effect since for over 10 years, and that's why we had yeah, so th undertaken time, to review it. Yes, it, no, it's ab absolutely time. 800, I, we are in full 800 would that. not be an unreasonable yeah. fee. Again, we, we need to make sure that it calibrates to all of these costs, because it, it, $800, I, I'm not, I would be interested to have a conversation with you to see how those, that amount was arrived at, because um, we need to take into account the various types of productions that are happening, the length of time the productions are happening, what are the appropriate fees we can charge as a city according to these rules. So I, I, I am in full support of restructuring. I would be interested to have a conversation with your office to understand how the $800 figure was arrived at. Yeah. But we are absolutely in agreement that we need to review and restructure the, yeah. the fees. And, and I would hope that um, with all this money coming into the city from these film shoots, that some of the money or a good portion would go to your office um, to have more personnel work on these. And then um, I think everybody would be happier if there was better oversight. Yes. Do you have any other? Yeah. Thank okay. you, Chair. Just because for the sake of time and we have others that we really want to hear from, yes. I look forward to working with you to make this experience beneficial to all stakeholders. And sometimes it doesn't take much more than communication for the general public yes. and as we figure out what notice could possibly be given in advance, as well as to the fee structure, which I would imagine would be dependent on potentially the size of the shoot. Is it a non-for-profit? Is it a college student? Should be in consideration. It shouldn't be a blanket approach. So a uh, silver screen production coming into the great city of New York um, shouldn't be in the same permit uh, price as a college student from around the corner that's looking to do something uh, to help promote the business that they're looking to start. There's considerations mm -hmm. that we're looking for. So I look forward to continuing our meetings and discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I'll echo that. Uh, it, we'll, we'll work with your office and we, we, uh, we're already hearing good things from your office so it's, it's encouraging. Thanks Commissioner and thanks panel for your testimony. Thank you for the time. Thank you. All right, we're, we're going to the next panel. Uh, we're going to hear from the community, um, residents, and civic. Um, and the first, uh, Nancy Sogalzorich, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, Jeffrey Elkin, and Mark Amoruso. Yeah, but the, the two, we're, got, we're going to do, uh, because we, um, we do have to exit this room by one, so, so we're going to put a two minute clock on your testimony, so try to summarize. Oh yeah, yeah.
if you need more. Maybe. Nancy, you want to do you want to begin? So I guess um, I had a whole speech written, but a lot came up during the meeting that I wasn't aware of about the rules and the regulations, which is my major issue with the filming in my area. Um, I feel safety for me is the biggest concern because since they're not following the rules, it's, it's not all of the production companies. I am a major supporter of the pro production in my area. I was, and all my neighbors hate me for it, and now I'm here speaking on their behalf, since we are being harassed. I, when I make 311 complaints that I don't know how are logged, because it's for the illegal standing, the idling trucks, the garbage, the trespassing on our property. We have a private alley and they just drive right through speeding. My kids are out there playing. Um, the issues are so many. But I want to get back to, I know you guys spoke about a few things that I want to make a point, filming, okay? You said you're supposed to know two days before. Do you know they're filming today? Councilman Holdwood. Do you know that they're filming today by Broadway stages? Okay. so. I, are they allowed to take at this parking spots from the neighborhood how many hours before their permit? Because 10 p.m. around the corner while I was walking in, they're, they're taking the parking in no standing zones. I thought that no standing means no standing. Are they allowed to park in no standing? Because then maybe my community doesn't have an issue. But how are fire trucks going to make the turn? We are on a street where there is no tr a truck restriction. When these trucks come down the block, they can't turn because people are parked in no standing. They're idling next to a 90-year-old woman's home. And it's not all the crews, but how are we going to track the bad crews? Do they have a process of evaluating these production companies? These are things that I want to enforce. I want to be able to call 104 and know that I'm going to be able to talk to them and hold in office and my community board. I'm getting no help for the past three years. I have thousands of complaints. I've sent your office over 85 photos this week on my own lunch hours. I need help. This is ridiculous. Am I up? <laughs> yeah. Oh, th thank you. And, and, and I, you know, we share your frustration, and that's why you heard today about um, not being receptive at MOM and not listening enough. Yeah, I mean, but, it's but this is this is a we're bringing we're we're on your side on that one because we do get a lot of complaints in my office. About how do we that. track it as citizens? Like the permits, what website do I know that they're coming? There's multiple crews at multiple times. They misuse the permits. They make multiple copies. They're extending their boundaries. All these things. We just need compliance. We need oversight and we need compliance yeah. so we can work together. Okay. Thank thank you, Jeffrey. Good afternoon, members of the Committee on Small Business and the Committee on uh, Technology. I'm here today in my capacity as the president of the Ridgewood Property Owners and Civic Association. My name is Jeff Elkin. Um, I didn't think I was going to share this before I heard this morning's testimony, but I happen to be an attorney licensed here in New York, and I've spent the better part of my career uh, working with Deloitte and a number of the big four consulting firms on administrative governance of regulatory agencies and their capacity to conduct risk-based supervision and oversight. And that was the last thing that I thought was ever going to come up, tan even tangentially, this morning. But what I really want to talk to you, at least for now, about is my experience and our community's experience with the film industry. And Ridgewood and the communities in uh, Queens Community Board 5 are certainly proud of our newfound cinematic uh, popularity, especially with the film industry. That being said, in the past year, we've been experiencing too much of a good thing. Uh, and actually, it used to be a good thing. It is no longer. We've become a filming hotspot by any definition of that term. And just as a quick aside, what I heard earlier described as a, def a sliding definition of hotspot doesn't seem to match any 
definition of hotspot I've seen by comparing uh, filming, film production legislation in other cities, either in Canada or elsewhere in the United States. So we, we don't have a hotspot definition, uh, certainly one that's not operable here in New York. Um, what we're seeing is an unacceptable increase in the number and frequency of large-scale film shoots. Um, I'm going to just, I'm going to do a, a quick rocket uh, list of the types of issues and challenges we've identified uh, with respect to film production in our communities. These require greater scrutiny, and I can provide this but in email form you know, after today's testimony so you can have it in writing. Um, again, these are observations simply by what I see on the ground in Ridgewood over the past five years. All right. Uh, we, we have to wrap it up, so can I can you summarize? Yeah. Right. The permitting process is broken. Uh, the Mayor's Office of Management and Entertainment appears unable to efficiently manage the permitting process or conduct effective oversight. In fact, from what I've seen, personal experiences with filming, there's no oversight, period. Can, can I ask you how long do you think you have to testify? Because if it's lengthy, we can sub, you could submit it in writing. I can do we that We have too. 15 more people signed up to right. testify, and each one's supposed to get can no I give more you than three I'll minutes. I'll give you the headlines, just so you, you know what, what's coming. Hot spots. I don't think the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment knows where the hot spots are in this city. We are certainly one. They, they have no clue from our perspective. Poor communication, lack of advance notice. Basically, notice comes usually two or one, and sometimes negative one days you know, after, after the fact. Yeah, okay, we have to summarize, Jeff. Um, by the way, is anybody from the mayor's office, Moam, here? You're, okay, thank you. So you're listening. <laughs> All right. And I'll, okay, thank and you. I'll just give you the three headlines. All right, Matt? One more. Hurry up. It's quickly. Okay. <laughs> Ineffective, no parking signage. The signage doesn't mean what it says, and you know, it doesn't say what it means. Um, common abuses of the permitting process. Uh, sc scope creep, where, where production companies that have applied print more signs, and they expand them down adjacent streets. Other, other fun abuses are just making and, it and up. And we talked about these yeah. today. Unauthorized, and, and so, okay. unauthorized right, filming. Thank, thank you. Thank yeah. you. All right, next. And the last item is uh, mayor's office transparency. They don't have the right information right. technology systems to manage Ex exactly. what they're supposed to do. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, thank you thank for you. letting me finish that. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Amoruso. I'm a 30-year Tribeca resident. I'm also a member of Community Board 1 in Lower Manhattan. I'm just going to wear the community board hat for one second. I was asked by my co-chair to submit a resolution that we uh, uh, dealt with this subject on the issue of parking. It's from June 2018. Uh, that's in your packet there. We're also going to take up this issue about the uh, uh, intro, uh, res uh, the intro administrative codes in our quality life committee in, um, in uh, next month. So we'll have more information for you on that. Uh, now for my personal testimony. Um, I, uh, I, be, I was a former location manager, so I have a little bit of uh, insight into, into uh, you know, what, what was said. And I hope we have continuing hearings on this as well going forward. Uh, of course, acknowledge because of that that the film industry does supply a lot of jobs, and sometimes I have to fend off the residents. I always get the phone call when there are issues because I have the experience that, listen, you know, uh, these guys are mostly local folks that are working, small businesses and, and that, all that. but. But there's also a balance. Uh, there are a lot of good uh, uh, film companies, but there are also some bad ones. Uh, you mentioned billions, but we actually had good experience with them. Uh, we had bad experience with the FBI show. Uh, but uh, personally, in regards to the local laws, I support all of them. But there was a note about the 14-day notice. You have to define what special means, the definition of special parking. Um, now, consequently, uh, like it's been mentioned, that uh, CB1, like other districts and neighborhoods, have quality of life disruptions, uh, equipment trucks, tars being towed. Uh, additionally, alternate side parking has been taken away. Um, and just one thing about MoMA, uh, the, um, uh, the mayor's office on film. Uh, we have a good relationship with them. They'll, they'll, we'll, they'll get back to us. It's better than most agencies, actually. So just, you know, I know they'll beat up a little bit here, but, but I think they're just, they're, they are, um, um, 
I think, overwhelmed by the bureaucracy, and, and things need to change. So I'll be quick with the last two points. I think these two points, and this is addressed actually in our CB1 resolution uh, that can uh, assist some of the topics you were talking about. Point one, film, and, film production companies must have a justification for taking away alternate side street parking for non-filming purposes, and that this justification requirement be a question that is added to the permit application. This should be citywide. We got a rejection letter from, from, from their office about this, but I think they misunderstood. They thought that it would just be special for, for uh, the CB1 district, but um, uh, we wanted citywide. And, and it, these, these need to be policies and procedures that you gotta put in your administrative code, because I don't know if they'll do it on their own, honestly. Yeah. Uh, the second point addresses the other chair, is that the film production company provide a neighborhood liaison with contact information for the community to contact with any issues at any time. Often the phone number on the film permit is, uh, goes to a voicemail, or um, especially if it's on a weekend, and the weekend it's difficult to get in touch with the city's o city office. And uh, I, I think uh, both of these requests should not be difficult for the mayor's office to implement, and it would not negatively affect any jobs in the film industry at all. So I thank the council for, uh, for having this hearing. Uh, we hope to look uh, forward to more hearings. And just question, how long is the record open for it so we know uh, how long we have to give you more information? How long I think to the end of the day, correct? No, submit, to submit, submit testimony, uh, testimony. A comment on the bills. By tomorrow. By to yes. tomorrow yeah, okay. By tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Mm -hmm. Next panel is uh, Hillary Smith, mm -hmm. Angela Mealy, <clears throat> and Les Fincher. Whoever wants to start. Sure. Hello, good, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for letting us be here. This is um, actually really interesting, and you have all brought up really good points. So I, uh, I know there's a brief timeline, so I'll just jump into it. My name is Hillary Smith. I'm the unit production manager on the Warner Brothers TV show Blind Spot. The role, my role as the UPM is to manage all aspects of the production's administration, including hiring crew, locations, and budget from pre-production through the end of principal photography. Uh, the, the biggest thing that we are concerned about is the 14-day rule. Um, that would cause a lot of issues for us. We are on a very short timeline, which was brought up, um, you know, for our show and for many shows, we're a one-hour show, so we have seven to nine days to produce that show. We basically are out on location anywhere from four to five days during that time period. In that time period, from the time we get the script, we have to find the location, get it approved, talk to the location, work out a deal, get the permits, talk to the community boards, which we do, talk to any co-op boards that you might have to talk to, talk to the businesses, get the parking, find parking in the area for residents that we're displacing for our crew, and it's just not enough time to do that within that 14-day rule. Um, it's, and especially with weather, as, uh, as the winter's coming up, we have unforeseen weather issues that uh, happen all the time. It would be real hard to do that. 72 hours would be also be a challenge, but it's something that I think we would be willing to address and not agree to, but if that's, you know, 48 hours really works well. Um, I understand that it may not be getting the information out to people in time, but we are certainly willing to open to the conversation of how to do that better. And, you know, I know that I used to live on Reed Street, and it's a real pain. I get that. You know, I live in New York City. I live in the Upper East Side. There's filming all the time. I'm open to the dialogue and helping the city and the productions to work in getting this, this whatever is the best way to get it done, done. So everyone is happy. I live here. I want to continue working here. My colleagues who live here and work here are really pro-filming. We want to keep it here, and we want to do everything we can to help. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Angela Mealy. I'm with the Motion Picture Association. 
Our members are Disney, Sony, Warner Brothers, Paramount, NBC Universal, Netflix, and CBS. And our members have had a long history of filming here and even more with the boon that you've heard about in terms of the $9 billion impact here. So we really appreciate and we appreciate your having this dialogue because we know it's been a concern for the neighborhoods. And as you've heard before, we actually have been working very closely with all of our industry partners, our stakeholders, to try to address this problem, and it's been a problem for a while. And one of the things that we have a concern with, with respect to the two bills, intro 937 and 1700, is the fact that those timings are very difficult, and if we're unable to comply with it, you're going to see productions fleeing the city, and that's not what we want to have happen. And so we look forward to having that dialogue. I think legislating that is going to be difficult. And I think what I heard today was a problem is a communication, not necessarily the time frame, but you weren't actually getting that notice. And I think that's something that we want to make sure happens, that that actual notice happens, not that we change the notice timing, because I think that could be detrimental. And so the other thing I just want to say quickly is we support the increase in the fees, and we'd like to see that money earmarked to the film office, because I think they need the resources from what I've heard here today. So we look forward to working with you and be happy to address any questions that you have, and thank you for this opportunity. And I agree with almost everything you said, um, so I appreciate that. Uh, Councilman Yeager? Hi. Um, I, I, I just want to clarify. Um, it's not, I think I, if I understand what you're saying, it's, it's not just that we're not getting the notices, but the time frame within the notices, we're, we get them uh, possibly 72 hours before um, a film is about to uh, take off, a production is going to happen. You, you understand that that happens, right? Right, and, and what Hillary alluded to and others is there are a lot of decisions that, that happen at the last minute, and we worked with the council. We had an issue with the predictable scheduling that you had done before because things happen very quickly. At, at that point, we had a concern because this industry operates very differently than any other business. We're not, we're not able to actually know and tell an employee maybe in a, in a week how many hours you're going to work because there could be decisions. You know sometimes maybe the night before where you're going to film. So that 48 hours, as far as I know, we've been trying to comply with that. And obviously, I'm right. hearing that I, there I are think, some problems with that. I think what you're but, hearing from council members is that you know, 48 hours is great, except if, if, I, get, if I find out that on you know, Thursday at 9 o'clock at night by an email sent to my city council email address that there's something going to happen in my neighborhood on a Saturday, it gives me very little time to put a stop to it, and I need to stop it mm -hmm. because it's going to destroy my neighborhood. And I, that is not hyperbole. A production in some parts of my neighborhood on a Saturday will destroy my neighborhood. And I need to be able to stop that. And if you're, if the reason that there's a requirement that council members receive notice is so that we can have input. It's not just to, otherwise, why let me know? If I can't do anything about it, don't, send, don't tell me that it's happening. Um, the whole idea, and I'm, I don't mean to make you the target. You just happen to be no, sitting there fine. in the seat, so, and you have the microphone, so it's your turn. But I, I, there, there's a reason that, we're asked, that we, we've asked and our predecessors in this body have asked that we be part of the notification. Uh, there are a lot of things that happen in the city that we don't get told about every single day. But we wanted to know, our predecessors who instituted this requirement wanted to know when is a film going to happen in their neighborhood. And if, we, if we're told in a manner that allows us to do nothing other than receive the email and great, thank you, it serves no purpose. We want to have enough notice so that we can then reach out to the mayor's office of production and say, well, you know, this just doesn't work for us. Um, and, and the manner in which we do receive the notice almost lends itself to the thought that perhaps it's intentional that we're, giving, we're being given such short notice so that we can't raise that much of a stink. And again, not blaming you, you didn't make the rules, right, you're complying with what you have, but I don't think that any major production of which it, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and dozens of trailers and, and hundreds of people are involved you know, the trigger for that gets pulled 72 hours before the event. It's just hard to believe. What? Well, you want to take that? Um, 
I mean, you can respond or not. It's, it's, yeah, you, you don't have to you respond. My on it. Unfortunately, it does, though. That's, you know, there, oh. I, we were filming a scene today, and I flew an actor in last night because we changed the order of things. And we're filming a stage, so it's not affecting anyone. But it just is an unfortunate and unpredictable business, and it happens. And do better. And I would, listen, I would love it. I don't want to work 16 hours a day. I'm exhausted all the time. But uh, it's, you know, I don't know how to make it better. I'm not here to change it to make it better. I want to help, and I'm here to do that. But, you know, I certainly sympathize with what you're saying. And, and I, I, I'm open to it. I don't know, you know, what would you do, though, if you got the notice and you didn't want us there? What I would call would the happen? mayor's office and I would say, stop these people from coming into my neighborhood and destroying it. I, I need to have a neighborhood where people can live. I represent, the, like all my colleagues here, we represent 180,000 or thereabouts people. Sure. And, and they have rights, too. And they pay for those streets. See, yes. And I, frankly, I, I production companies way. didn't pay for those streets. And certainly the $300 uh, filing fee for an application didn't pay for the streets. And the four, $9 billion that gets spent in New York City and the $400 million in tax revenue uh, is not being spent in my neighborhood. Um, with, with due respect, and again, I, right. I don't mean to be disrespectful. You just happen to be sitting in the seats, so Absolutely. you have the microphone, yes. so it's your turn. But yeah, I, I, I think that we're entitled to ask that our neighbors, those who have put their lives into building the neighborhoods that you want to come in, and but you, I mean the industry, want to come in and film for three days, give us a break, give us some time, yeah. and if it doesn't work out for us because hey, it's, it's a holiday. For example, if somebody were to tell um, uh, my office tomorrow, me tomorrow on Friday, uh, um, tomorrow's not Friday, but or tomorrow is Friday, yeah. uh, that uh, we're going to start filming in your neighborhood on Monday and Tuesday of next week, that's going to cause me a heart attack. It's a big problem for me. You can't shut down my neighborhood on Rosh Hashanah. So, I need to be able to, and Councilman Deutsch represents a neighborhood similar to mine, sure. um, I need to be able to reach out to the mayor's office and say, you've granted a permit to these people who are going to film Detective Stabler running up and down the street. That's wonderful. I love him. But do me a favor. Make it a different day, if you don't mind. Yes, and, and I think that's a, an excellent point. It is, Two days is not enough time for me well, to make that happen. And on a holiday, and a religious holiday, I, you know, I think that there should be a reasonable amount of time. And I would think that the mayor's office would be respectful of that and not issue a permit in a specific neighborhood for a specific holiday. Well, we're working and that's that. a conversation that would have to continue with them as well. And I do believe that more than two days, and I would love it if you can come in here and say, you know what, we can make it work in our industry. And we can say we can give a week, a week, a week's notice to a community uh, to, to uh, be able to shut them down so that they could at least do some planning. I, I, think, I think for features, it's, they have some idea of where they're going to film generally, and I know they've worked with some communities and there have been some examples where they've tried to do what you're saying and give some idea of where they're going to be filming. But if you, especially with respect to television, it, it becomes really difficult to, first of all, legislate that, but second of all, to actually say those creative decisions can't be made, and so what that's going to have the effect of is having productions leave the city. Okay. And that's not what the effect we want, and we want to be respectful of the neighborhoods, but I think we, we've started working with Ando Castillo, and she's been a great partner. Even before this, these bills were introduced, she had reached out to the studios. She met with them last week. She's going to be, she was talking to us about these issues because of the growing film production in the city. She realizes we need to work with her office and the community and everybody to make sure we have a good balance. And so that's our commitment going forward. Yeah. Okay, okay, next, we just have to move on. Next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next panelist. You have the mic, you have a mic in front of you. You have that one. Oh. <laughs> good afternoon, members of the committee on small the business there. and the It's hard to speak closer. Is, yeah. Close. Okay. Good afternoon, member of the Committee on Small Business and the Committee on Technology. I'm Christina Godava, owner of the Park Delhi. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about my business and support I receive from the television and filming uh, industry. Since 2007, I have been proud owner of the Park Delhi, located at 209 Nassau Avenue, Greenpoint, 
uh, from, uh, across from Mac McGorlick Park in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. This deli is considered a Greenpoint institution to originally um, opened in 1931. The deli has changed ownership several times over the years, and I consider myself fortunate to be p a part of that 80 plus years history. In 2017, I almost lost the deli at the end of my 10 years lease. I was shocked when my landlord sa said my rent would be double what I was currently paying. As a small business owner, I could not afford to pay double the rent. I was devastated and had nowhere else to do do, to go. That is when my friends at Broadway Stages came to my res rescue. Broadway Stages supports my business regularly, buying food for their staff, clients, and family. But when they did, when they did in 2017, was about and beyond what most customers could um, or would be able to do. They could, could, could you could you wrap it up or just summarize? Excuse me. Could you wrap? Could you summarize your testimony because we're out of time? Oh, I just wanted to quickly thank. Okay. You. Okay. Uh, they heard about my situation and work when me uh, when uh, me and my landlord to make uh, arrangements to help me to pay the extra rent. They are also helping me to find a new location for my deli for the longer term. This type of support can come only from a company that truly cares about their com community and the local businesses. I'm blessed to still be in business. I owe that to my many regular customers and I own that to the Broadway stages. They are a family-owned company that selflessly uh, share their own success with the community and other local companies like mine. They believe I'm giving back to their neighborhood and do so many wonderful things. Uh, thank you for your time and the opportunity to share my experience working with the television and filming company. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next. Hello, my name is Les Fincher. I'm a location manager and location scout. And I've been in the business for over 30 years. I'm a board member of the Location Managers Guild International. And I have to say that, that as a location manager and a location scout, I'm the one that's the first one on the street trying to find places to shoot. I, I work diligently with the mayor's office for film and television. They work very, very, very consciously, work very hard to make sure all the rules are met every time and that film companies meet the requirements for parking. And they are, they're, respectful of the communities, the respectful of religious groups, schools, churches, and in holidays. The mayor's office is always there. As a location person on the street, I have donated money to community boards, to, to um, community centers. I've hired local folks to help me work in, neighbor, in, in like I was in Spanish Harlem, and I hired a local person from the Puerto Rican um, uh, Culture Center to help me work the neighborhood. I've done all those things I've suggested. And I think as a community, the location managers truly do care about the sensitivity of our industry on the street. And I'm, I'm someone who walks through and makes sure those cables are covered. And it's, a, it's a rare that they're not covered because I, think, I know the grips and the electrics are working very hard to preserve our job and preserve safety. And all these stories about the, the let's say, the bad companies, they're few because we work very, very hard to bring this and the consciousness of filming in a positive note. The unions do on every level, and the unions give back to communities. I give myself up. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, Haim Deutsch, uh, you have a council member who has a question for the panel? Yeah, I'll, I'll only be 15 minutes, if you don't mind. I'm kidding. So uh, first of all, I want to thank you for being here today and testifying. And so there's a few issues that I have. Number one, first of all, I want to, you know, the, the mayor's office of entertainment, when before they have a film, they do send notices like a, a few days before, which in, in the interim, I send it over to my community board in that area. Um, just to let them know in case there's any issues, this is where we tackle it uh, a few days before rather than, you know, the day of. Uh, so some of the issues that I have is that the collaboration uh, between um, the media, the, the mayor's office of media entertainment and National Grid, Con Edison, um, the MTA, DDC, so like I know in my district in particular, Brighton Beach has a, um, it's probably one of the most used neighborhoods because I get notifications all the time. Like I could get one every couple of weeks. Do, we're doing a film in Brighton Beach. And in those areas, um, especially in Southern Brooklyn where it's congested, and then you have a film and you have MTA doing work, that, which they're currently doing right now. DDC has a project. Uh, and then between all the other agencies and emergencies that come up, so sometimes we have like five different, uh, a few different utility companies, and then you have city agencies and a film all at the same time. And so one, one most important issue is to have that collaboration that, yes, there's work to do um, between the mayor's office and the film companies to get the film done, but there is another piece of the puzzle, and that needs to be done, is by reaching out to everyone who may be out there and to try to collaborate with them and work together. This way we don't destroy your neighborhood when there is a film. Um, I, I also had working for my predecessor, we had NBC Studio uh, in, in our district uh, when, uh, back when NBC was in business on Avenue uh, L Locust and East uh, 14th Street. And there everything was in-house, uh, so that you know, didn't impact the neighborhood as much. But then another thing that I've seen is that when they take out the permit, they're issued, um, like they could be issued, let's say, two blocks of parking, and then when they use the space, they only use one block. So you're taking up an additional extra block for no reason. So there needs to be more oversight of how much space, how much space you exactly you need, so this way it doesn't impact uh, the neighborhood. Um, one other thing is that I had a, a, a bill in the city council, and I have to check where, where it is now because I know I had um, conversations that when there is a permit for a film in a certain neighborhood, and that area has alternate side of the street parking, which is uh, in effect. So during that time, for if you take up, let's say, 200 parking spaces or 100 parking spaces or 50 during those times when alternate side of street parking is, is in effect, they should be suspended equal amounts of parking spots during that time by having those companies put out signs saying that this, uh, this block is currently suspended from this and this hour. This way we give back a little bit to the community. So again, I welcome you in my district. Um, and but we, we need to work together. We need to work in partnership to make sure that we don't get any, we don't receive any complaints. And I have to say that the mayor's office has been very accommodating when we had issues. They've been very responsive in resolving it a few days before. So I'm, I'm glad that we could work together in that part. But there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Okay, thank you, panel. Thanks so much. Next panel, uh, Deb Garcia, Rudy Caligari. Marnie Majorelle and Joe Falco. So, Chairman, Joe Falco had to leave because he couldn't stay so Joe long. Joe Falco's so not here. Okay. Yeah, he, he all right. We'll, all right. We have we have three panelists. Then we're we're going to this will be the last panel before we have to move probably in the next room. We're trying to because there's another committee coming in at one. So, we'll try to get extra time in here if we can, but if not, we'll have to move to the chambers next door. Please adhere to the two minute time clock. Yeah, we have a two minute time clock. That's what that, that bell is. Okay, whoever wants to start? Good afternoon. 
Uh, my name is Marnie Majorell. I'm the founder of Alive Structures. Um, we're a certified woman-owned business. We specialize in designing and installing green roofs and ecological gardens. Um, I'm here today because I want to talk about particularly my relationship with Broadway Stages um, and the work that we've been doing together to create green roofs. Broadway Stages is a family-owned television and film production company. Um, they have been in business for more than 35 years, and in that time, they have worked to not only meet the growing needs of their industry, but also focused on sourcing from and looking, working with local and state-based vendors and suppliers. Uh, I say this as a company that has had the fortune of being one of those businesses. Broadway Stages works with hundreds of local companies and engages everything from plumbers, electrical suppliers, lumber, roofing, and HVAC to engineers, architects, printing services, catering, coughing, coffee shops, and so much more. It literally takes a village of service providers to produce a television show or movie. I know this because of the work I do with them and I see firsthand the other vendors that come to support their clients as well as the projects that I work on. I can honestly say that they work deliberately to direct their investments to local businesses including women and minority owned companies and they encourage others to do the same. But their consideration goes beyond direct economic growth. Broadway Stages also cares deeply about their community, supporting social programs, education, the arts, and environmental sustainability through financial, in-kind, and volunteer resources. They make a difference in our community and invest several hundred thousand dollars a year into local programs. <laughs> Broadway Stages is sincere in their caring, creative in their approach, and effective in their actions. Their investments in green infrastructure and renewable energy projects, including Kingsland Wildflowers and Eagle Street Rooftops, um, shows their real sincere commitment to the environment. And I just want to say one last thing. I've been in business since 2007 doing green roofs. Um, it takes a big commitment on a property owner's behalf. I usually find a lot of the funding for these projects. And even with finding the funding, I cannot find property owners to do green roofs. Broadway Stages is the only property owner since 2007 that I have worked with to give this kind of commitment to green infrastructure. And it has made a huge difference in my business and in my whole industry because we are working on over 60,000 square feet of green roof with them. So I just want to say that not only are they doing something for their community, but they're doing something for the city. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Jonai, Chairman Holden, and members of the Committee of Small Business and, and the Committee of Technology. I'm Deborah Garcia, Executive Director of Camp Brooklyn Fund. We're a not-for-profit organization that offers children from economically disadvantaged families an opportunity to leave their urban environment and experience sleepaway camp. I'm here today to talk about the impact of the film industry and to tell you about my experience working with Broadway Stages, a local family-owned TV and film production company. Camp Brooklyn provides children with an experience of a lifetime, one that opens up a world of opportunities to young people. We truly believe that camp transforms children, families, and our community. It takes $750 to send each child to camp for two glorious, life-changing weeks. Through the generosity of caring individuals and companies like Broadway Stages, we have been able to send more than 3,500 children to sleepaway camp since our organization's inception in 2002. The personal commitment of Broadway Stages, Gene Argento, Tony Argento, Monica Hollowatz, and the rest of the staff is truly amazing. They understand that this group of children deserve the same experiences as others that are able to pay for this type of adventure. Our community is blessed to call Broadway Stages a friend and a neighbor, and we are especially proud that they are members of our board, and, re and which requires additional time and commitment. Those who know Broadway Stages know they are generous beyond measure, and that their dedication to the community is sincere and heartfelt. 
They share their success with their neighbors, with local businesses and organizations. I, for one, am grateful for their steadfast approach to conducting their business and giving back to their community. Thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you so much for that. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, my name is Rudy Caligari, and I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO of Edge Auto Rental. And I'm here to uh, tell you how Edge Auto Rental has uh, grown uh, because of the film industry. Uh, we started back in uh, 2006 with just a few employees and less than 40 vehicles. Um, today, I'm, I'm able to employ over 100, 100 individuals, and we've grown our fleet size to over 900. Um, Edge has developed uh, to be one of the uh, larger companies that are able to supply vehicles in the industry, and we were able to supply vehicles for over 11,500 uh, productions that have happened over the years. Um, it's all because of the industry. The industry has really helped us, and we grew from a very small company to being, you know, again, being able to uh, employ over 100 people. Um, I was also a, 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 a crew member many years ago, and looking at some of the proposals, I want to say that um, uh, we would oppose uh, uh, 1700 and it's 14 days uh, notification. Uh, just knowing that does, just does not work. Um, uh, so I want to say that on the record, and also I want to say that I do support 158. Um, the mayor's office needs all the help they can get. They've been doing a great job in, in helping, helping filmmakers, helping vendors, and helping the city itself. And the more support we could give them in a larger budget, providing that that money that, that is coming in from additional um, uh, permit fees goes to their office uh, would be nothing but help us all in general, regardless of, of where, you, where you are uh, at any point in the city. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for you. Thank you, panel. Uh, we'll do, can we do one more panel before we switch? We're going to have to switch rooms. Are we good? All right, let's, let me call the next panel, and if we're here, we're going to be here. If not, we'll have to move next door. Are we good? We got to move. Okay, we have to move. We're going to have a next panel come up in the chambers right next door through this door. Thank you. <laughs>